Okay, welcome everybody. We are so delighted to have you here for our COE Spring Retreat. We will give our guests a minute to come in. I am Allison Snow. I'm a member of the Community Outreach and Engagement Team and will be helping to MC today. We're gonna pull up our agenda for today's event. We'll start with some introductory remarks from some cancer center leaders and then hear from some exciting research presentations and then have a quick break followed by two roundtable discussion sessions. And then finally a quick wrap up. We will now hear from Dr. Ramon Parsons who is an ICON scholar, the director of the Tisch Cancer Institute at the ICON School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and the Ward Coleman Chair in Cancer Research. He's also the director of Mount Sinai Cancer for the Mount Sinai Health System and chair of the Department of Oncological Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Parsons. Well, thank you for that very warm, warm welcome. Uh, I just have a quick question. Oh, you have my slides. Great. So I'll just uh, get started. First of all, um, th this is a really uh, exciting day. We're going to uh, really focus on, um, you know, what what it is ab about us that makes us unique. What it is about us that uh, we can do for our community. How the community around us can help and inform uh, what we do here, and 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 hopefully. A brainstorm a little bit to um, figure out how to uh, make progress with cancer. So uh, just uh, 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 next slide, please. So this is a just a, a, a photograph looking down Madison Avenue of our main uh, campus uh, for the Tisch Cancer Institute uh, uh, on the um, on Madison Avenue and about 99th to 100th Street. Uh, uh, right, uh, uh, right in Manhattan, and you have a hundred. We have 172 members. Uh, we have four uh, research programs. Uh, these programs are um, teams of scientists that are led by co-leaders uh, that are focused on the topics shown: uh, cancer immunology, cancer mechanisms, mechanisms, cancer prevention and control, and uh, cancer clinical investigation. We have shared resources that uh, help uh, our scientists get the work done that they need to get done. And you can see they ranged on a variety of topics and shared resources that we call them cores in development that are actually not in development anymore. They're actually fully functioning, but for the purposes of the grant, they were new cores uh, and we wanted to, to roll them out uh, 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 gradually. Uh, next slide, please. So the history of the Cancer Center, uh, uh, it really uh, started in the early 90s with efforts to build a NCI designated cancer center. Uh, and Stephen Burakoff uh, uh, led our first NCI designation in 2015. And I uh, le led it, uh, the renewal, the first renewal in 2020. Uh, and uh, really it was spearheaded by a founding gift by the Tisch family uh, back in 2008. Next slide, please. Uh, the mission, our mission is uh, to advance basic clinical and population health cancer research to prevent cancer in healthy individuals and improve the lives of cancer patients and their families in our diverse communities. Next slide. And this is our uh, strategic vision. I won't re read the, the details, but basically we, uh, all the programs work on tumor microenvironment, genetics and genomics, diversity and equity and translation of research, but from different perspectives. And, and it's really important to identify these bridges across our programs in order uh, for us to facilitate uh, uh, inter, uh, interdisciplinary research, which we think is really uh, where a lot of innovation comes from and, and change. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our photographs of our associate directors. Uh, as you can see, Cardi Smith, is Associate Director for Community Outreach Engagement, also our Deputy Director, Joe Sperano, and all these different, uh, very highly talented, capable people uh, who are lending their efforts to our cause. Uh, next uh, next slide. We have new co-leader, Stephanie Blank. We just recently appointed uh, for women's cancers and Angela Diaz uh, just accepted the position. Um, and so we'll soon, uh, she will be taking on the role of Associate Director for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, our research programs, as I mentioned before, uh, are shown here, pick, depicted on, the, on, on this arrow that shows the transition from basic research all the way to translation to the communities. And we 
and we purposely have set up our research programs so that uh, they they don't overlap, but are, are allow for handoffs and collaborations uh, between programs in order to be able to um, really cover the full continuum of all the different aspects and expertise that are needed uh, to make headway with cancer and create a community of, of non-siloed scientists. Even if you're working in different fields, we wanna make a community where you know, every voice is heard, every perspective is, is appreciated. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, here are the co-leaders of our programs. Uh, I won't go through the names, but uh, you can see we have two co-leaders of each of our programs and the bolded boxes indicate new co-leaders that have just take, taken on their roles. Uh, that would be uh, Scott, Burn, uh, Scott Friedman, um, uh, uh, Jenny Lin, uh, and Samir Parekh. Next slide, please. And our clinical research leaders are shown in this, this slide. You can see our Associate Director for Clinical Research, uh, the uh, our different components of our clinical trials operation um, are shown here. Uh, and, uh, and their service is really is instrumental for us to be able to provide clinical trials uh, uh, to our patients. Uh, ne next slide. Uh, and our shared resources, I showed the shared list of shared resources earlier. Uh, and this is our Associate Director for Shared Resources, Jerry Chippick, the shared resource leaders you can see on the right and um, the corn development co-leaders are shown below. Next. And this is just an organizational chart uh, and you can see actually it hasn't even been updated yet because we uh, just got um, uh, Angela Diaz just took on uh, just took on this role. These are the two new leads and uh, this is uh, the associate directors and the, the various programs. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to give some insight into what our NCI grant is all about, um, last in 2020, we got a score of 27, uh, which is uh, in the excellent to outstanding range. Um, and the uh, primary area of concern for our community outreach and engagement section is that it needed uh, two things. One, it needed to be able to communicate and, and engage uh, with uh, effectively beyond just uh, East Harlem and the Upper East Side, but to the entire New York City. And it also, they wanted to see an increase of interactions between the COE, uh, community outreach and engagement with the research programs. For those of you who don't know what COE is, it's the part of the cancer center that uh, Cardi Smith is leading that is really critical. It assesses, uh, uh, first of all, it helps define our catchment area, which is New York City, and assesses the problems and issues in, 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 in our catchment area, and then also engages with the community across the city to understand what the issues and problems are to develop strategies uh, that can be helpful uh, for cancer. Uh, and um, anyway, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our catchment area is New York City. It's uh, These are the five boroughs of New York. This is where we're located, where the yellow star is. There's over 8 million people here. Uh, and we draw our patients, over 80%, or about 80% of them, from, from all uh, five boroughs uh, uh, of the city. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, a slide that uh, uh, the COE team put together, um, which uh, which uh, really sort of is really emblematic of the city we live in. It's a map of New York City with all the five boroughs, and you can see how we have a very diverse constellation of races and ethnicities, but they are somewhat segregated in where they live. And these are also follow uh, uh, often socioeconomic uh, um, uh, areas of socioeconomic uh, either. Um, uh, uh, strength or weakness, and and you can see here also that um, that this this uh, this issue, and you'll hear about this later today, is uh, really a, an area of where we can identify uh, using just these kinds of mapping functions where some of the greatest problems are and how we can potentially develop some solutions. Okay, next slide. Uh, one another thing that is exciting news is that. Uh, uh, we announced that we're gonna, with a $60 million gift from the Tisch family to establish a Mount Sinai Tisch Cancer Hospital. Uh, it's gonna be on Madison Avenue and it's gonna have four floors. Uh, it's gonna be um, expected to be uh, completed in 2025. And it's not only gonna be providing uh, services uh, for cancer patients, but also be a framework for providing the most cutting edge 
um, uh, clinical clinical research that will allow for uh, the best care uh, uh, possible for our patients. Uh, this is just some pictures depicting what it's going to look like uh, in the lobby, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, and we're also um, we are, we've rolled out a lot of different centers of excellence as part of the Tisch Cancer Institute in multiple disease areas like uh, multiple myeloma, breast cancer, prostate, et cetera. Uh, and these, these combine exceptionally high expertise with integrated care, research, innovation, and teaching. And they also provide patients with access to clinical trials and patient navigation. Next slide, please. And then this is my last slide. Uh, this is uh, something that um, I was really uh, proud to be a part of the day where this ribbon cutting uh, took place. Uh, that was really uh, spearheaded by Robert Smith's donation to develop um, mobile prostate cancer screening um, here in New York City uh, to try to find, uh, and, and based on the information we have going to the neighborhoods that have the, the, the greatest need, uh, which is particularly in African-American uh, men uh, in, 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 in certain, certain uh, neighborhoods in New York. Uh, and uh, this is just a photograph from inside the mobile van uh, and uh, outside on the right. And anyway, I'm looking forward to fun, a fun day uh, um, and uh, an, an interesting, uh, interesting stuff going on. Uh, take care, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Parsons, for that wonderful introduction. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cardinal Smith, who is the Associate Director of Community Outreach and Engagement at the Titch Cancer Institute. Dr. Smith is also a medical oncologist and palliative care physician and Chief Quality Office, Officer of Cancer at Mount Sinai. Please welcome Dr. Smith. Hi everyone, thank you for being here today. <clears throat> so my video was a little slow, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep, okay, great. Um, thank you for being here today. We are excited to have our inaugural retreat with all of you. And we really hope that this helps to spark a wonderful conversation um, between the researchers and some of the cancer center doctors and leaders um, and all of you in the community so that we can really be sure that the work that we are doing are meeting the needs of the community. All right. So <clears throat> the mission of the COE is to work with members of our community to address cancer disparities and reduce the hardships of cancer for patients, families, caregivers, and communities across all five boroughs of New York City. And we really are focused throughout every stage of cancer care and throughout the trajectory of cancer um, identification. So starting with risk reduction, screening, diagnosis, treatment, survivorship, and then end of life for, for those in whom that may be applicable. Our vision is to identify the needs that members of the community say are important. It's why we're here today to hear from all of you. And then we really wanna be able to share that information um, and we want to help ways that we can engage together as partners in this work. Um, but the other leaders here with me today um, is Melissa Mazur, uh, Dr. Melissa Mazur, who is our uh, nursing research scientist, um, Dr. Allison Snow, who is moderating for us, and Lena Dandor. Um, and most importantly, we work with our community advisory board. Um, and our community advisory board is made up of community-based organizations, uh, patient advocates, some of whom you will also be meeting today, federally qualified health centers, and then faith-based organizations. You can go to the next slide. Um, so we have identified six priority cancers based on feedback that we've heard from our community members, as well as information that we've obtained about what cancer looks like in New York City. And so the six cancers that we've identified are breast, colorectal, liver, lung, multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer, and not many people are familiar with it, but you'll hear more about it today and then prostate cancer. And some of the ways in which we've identified these cancer types was one, looking at how common they are in the community. So when we look at the rates of these cancers, do we see more of them in New York City compared to the state or to the country? The other thing we looked at are how are people doing once they have this cancer? Do we see differences in how long people live with this cancer? 
um, something that we call their mortality. Um, and we do see differences for these six cancer types in terms of how long people live with this cancer, both in New York City when compared to the state and compared to the United States as a whole. Um, and most importantly, we see that there are inequities, both in terms of the number of, of, of people who identify as people of color, specifically those who identify as Black and Hispanic or Latino, um, in terms of how common these cancers are, but also how long someone lives with this cancer. And we know that some of these cancers are associated with particular risk factors. So we know that obesity um, is something that contributes to specific cancer types, um, either by, uh, by obesity itself or obesity causing other diseases like diabetes. Um, and we know that happens to be specifically important in liver cancer, breast cancer. There's some connections being started to be made um, at our institution in multiple, for multiple myeloma as well. Um, and so, um, and we know that these, uh, you know, obesity in and of itself is sort of a structurally, a structural factor and that there are things that are going on in our environment where we live, who has access to healthy food, who can afford healthy food that helps contribute to rates of obesity and diabetes that tend to be higher in communities of color. Next slide. So when we look at um, our cancer outreach across New York City, um, Ramon Parsons talked to you already about how we are using our screening bands in particular um, for breast and prostate cancer. And we're really targeting those neighborhoods where we know are impacted the most by cancer. So for example, and I won't read through all of these, but the Bronx um, has particular cancer types where we know are much more prevalent, but also where people tend to not live as long if they're diagnosed with them. And that would be liver, lung, prostate, breast, colorectal. And in particular, we know that there are Spanish speaking and um, Latino populations who are particularly impacted by the cancer types that we've shared. And so our goal is to look at what the community data tells us, what our community members are telling us are things that they are seeing in their neighborhoods and targeting our vans to go to those specific neighborhoods so that we can hopefully reach patients and people whom we may not have other, otherwise been able to contact. Next slide. And so how are we incorporating your community feedback? Well, we do that in several different ways. One is that we have a survey booklet um, that we give to community members um, and we ask questions often, particularly of our advisory board, um, for them to, to, to tell us how things are going, where they see opportunities for improvement. But also in 2018, we did a, um, a, catchment, uh, a survey specific to the Harlem area uh, to understand thoughts about cancer, areas for opportunity, um, and how people really engaged in their cancer risk reduction and screening care. Um, the other thing we're doing is that we have health educators that are bilingual and speak several languages based on the, both the languages that we see commonly in our neighborhoods and those in which we know are impacting our, our patients with our community with cancer. And so that happens to be Spanish, Russian, French, Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. One of the things we've heard feedback over time from our community members is that it, it can be really hard to contact somebody that um, even if you want to receive screening, it can be hard to identify how to do that or to be connected to someone. Um, and we know that systems and organizations can be complex. And so one of the things we were able to do was to create an outreach phone line. And so this is one specific phone line that will connect you to whom you need to be connected to um, for linkage to screening appointments. Um, next is the community voice surveys, which we talked about, I talked about already a little bit. Um, and we're going to be planning on launching a new survey um, New York citywide next year. And then finally, we have what we call science talk presentations. So this is where we have scientists from within our cancer center come to our community advisory board and speak to our community members about topics that they've identified as important 
and topics that are aligned with our priority cancer areas. And again, our hope is that the researchers can hear feedback from the community, both about how we should be engaging in terms of recruitment to studies, or what are those questions that the community have that are really important for us to start to evaluate. Next slide. And so what I'm hoping that we'll be able to do today is to share with those of you who are members of our community, what's going on in our cancer center, focusing on some of those priority areas that we've talked about so that you know what Sinai is engaged in. I also hope that it can really spark conversation. In order for us to continue to be innovative and to lead the cancer space, we need to be doing that based off of what everyone in the community has identified as important, not just what we think that is. And we also want you to be able to engage with us in this work so that we can be doing what's meaningful. Um, and so, uh, next slide. Yep, so with that, um, I'd like to thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to really wonderful engagement. I know there will be lots of opportunity for questions um, and look forward to where we can take this next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. I will now turn it over to Ms. Colette Smith, who is a member of our community advisory board and a seven year lung cancer survivor. And she will be speaking about the importance of early detection in cancer. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Colette Smith and I'm thanking you for the opportunity um, to put on a little lipstick and some mascara, but mostly though for the opportunity to talk about my survivorship with lung cancer. I was diagnosed with lung cancer in February of 2015. And that's shortly after my husband was diagnosed with prostate cancer the year before. Um, I learned a lot from his experience and I was very prayerful and hopeful when um, doctors were hinting that something was going on with me. Um, I knew, I said, you know, I thought that you know, for sure, my family has pays, paid its dues with the cancer diagnosis, but um, I, I wasn't that fortunate. Or maybe the, what, how I should um, put it is I was fortunate because I was able to get the right care. Um, I became more of my own, more aware of my own health uh, as I was experiencing odd sensations in my chest. And for the sake of my health, and peace of mind, I went to get checked out at the emergency room. After having a low dose CT scan, which is an x-ray that takes a picture of the lungs all the way around, the screening showed that I had lung nodules on both sides, which are abnormal masses on both sides of my lungs. One of the physicians I met with diagnosed my nodules as, can as cancer and recommended immediate surgery. However, I wasn't um, sure that's the step that I wanted to take um, when in fact there were no real diagnostic procedures or screening done. My journey will not necessarily be your journey or any cancer survivor's journey, but I believe that, it, it, that it's every person's right to advocate for themselves and for the type of healthcare experience that they want. I knew that in order to properly take care of myself and ensure that I receive not only the best care, but also the right care, I would need to set a plan in place. And to, to define the best plan, um, you need to determine the route you wanna take. For me, the first step was getting confirmation that my nodule was cancerous. Fortunately, I found a cardiothoracic surgeon who took the time to explain to me why he believed my nodule was early stage lung cancer. Yay, Dr. Andrew Kaufman for taking the lead in my care and um, for definitely guiding me. And um, our next step was to remove it. Oops, I am sorry, put the phone on mute. The next step was to determine my care and um, during surgery, the doctor explained, Dr. Kaufman explained that he would test a nodule and he would determine like, what are the next steps? Should we remove your entire lung? Should we give you a, a to remove a section of the lung? And fortunately for me, I was diagnosed with early stage cancer, stage 1A. 
And my doctors treated me aggressively by removing my upper, my entire upper left lung. Uh, and I was told that, hey, these are your best chances. So this is why we're going to move aggressively. And that's what happened. My nodule did come back cancerous and due to its location, as I said before, the entire upper left lung was removed. The next step in my plan was to heal both physically and mentally. Physically, I wanted to learn more about my specific cancer mutation and was able to find the most fabulous oncologist um, at Mount Sinai, yay, Dr. Cardinal Smith, who assisted me with that. Additionally, I sought the help of pain management specialists who, added, who aided me in my recovery. On the other hand, mentally, I needed to address my own negative feelings towards having cancer. Um, I blamed myself, and that's kind of weird. I blamed myself. I, I felt like I failed my body and I failed myself. So it was important for me to find a therapist who could assist me with navigating those feelings. And fortunately, I found the right person who was able to do that. In the past, lung cancer was only associated with smoking, but what causes lung cancer can be so much more than just smoking. In fact, I am living proof that lung cancer is not just a smoker's disease. And by completing screening, you have made the first step in your own plan. Anyone who's suspecting that they may have been predisposed or exposed to, to elements in the environment which are uh, lung cancer causing, one of the first steps is to become aware and early screening and detection is very important. I am now seven years in remission and thankful that I took the initiative to first get screened. I advocated for myself and my treatment and created my own plan, a plan that I was comfortable with and I continue to pay attention to my own health. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, thanks very much, Ms. Smith. Um, we will now invite four researchers at the Tisch Cancer Institute to speak about their projects that are relevant to our catchment area of New York City and their important research focusing on overcoming disparities in cancer burden across New York City and aligning with the priorities of our community members. Our first speaker will be Dr. Goodman. She is a professor and vice chair for research and quality in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Mount Sinai. She is also the associate director for clinical research at the Tisch Cancer Institute, and she is internationally recognized expert in gastrointestinal cancers and is a member of the Cancer Clinical Investigation Program. Um, if you have any questions throughout her presentation, you can please feel free to type them into the Q&A and we will try to answer them. So thank you so much and welcome to Dr. Goodman. Great, thank you so much, Allison. And um, thank you for the invitation to speak today and um, I'm gonna welcome everyone to this uh, wonderful retreat. Um, so I'm gonna be speaking about expanding access to cancer clinical trials across uh, New York City. And I think we just had a fantastic introduction to really what the, you know, importance of clinical trials are for our patients. And, you know, I think the unique thing about uh, cancer is that really we've made it where we are in terms of our progress through um, research, whether it's bench research in the lab or clinical trials. I mean, we've really had to work through the steps of getting to where we are today with improving outcomes for our patients. And we're still not there yet. So, uh, clinical trials are really still a very important part of just our general management of patients with cancer. Um, so I am, I was very excited when I came here just over two years ago to have this mandate to um, help to improve access to clinical trials across New York City, um, because I feel that any patient living with cancer really should have the, the access to any of the newest treatments and the most um, exciting uh, and cutting edge clinical trials that are out there, uh, no matter where you are. Next slide. So this, uh, Dr. Uh, Parsons uh, showed this a few minutes ago, and I wanted to just point out that, you know, as part of our strategic uh, vision, we have these four pillars, 
And one of the pillars is really to address uh, diversity and equity in um, managing patients with cancer across our catchment area. Next slide. And this is really our, um, you know, uh, our, bent, our, our plan, our strategic plan for our group in the, um, uh, we, I I'm run something called the um, Cancer Clinical Trials Office. We've now just changed the name to uh, the Cancer Research Support Unit. And so one of our real goals is to address um, a, a diversity and equity in providing clinical uh, trial opportunities to patients, not just at the main campus, but across our entire catchment area of New York City. Next slide. And so at, um, these are some of the sites that where we have uh, oncology uh, units in New York City. So we, you can see the blue dot is our Mount Sinai Hospital, and we have the, um, the purple pins, which represent some of the sites across uh, Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. And we also have a new site um, uh, in South Nassau, um, so out in Nassau County. And one of the great things that we've been able to do is really standardize our ability to provide cancer care across these sites. So we, all of our cancer physicians are part of our uh, faculty of our medical school. We have um, these uh, disease-focused management teams and tumor boards that are um, attended by our physicians across the health system. And so, and actually with uh, Zoom and the changes with um, the pandemic, this has made it even more um, sort of, this has really facilitated that process because we're so used to using Zoom now. Um, we've been doing a lot of work to improve the facilities for um, providing cancer care. So at um, our downtown campus at, uh, at Chelsea and at West, Mount Sinai West, we've just re renovated the pharmacies. And we have a very stringent um, process for reviewing the scientific merit of all of the trials that are opened across the Mount Sinai Health System. And this is something that's actually required by the NCI because we are an NCI designated cancer center, but it means that there's really a, a sort of level of quality that's expected across all of the, um, the, uh, the sites across the system anytime we're doing clinical research. And finally, we have something called an institutional review board, which is the, um, the board or the entity that reviews all of the um, studies, the clinical trials, of any type of trial, even outside of cancer, to make sure that our patients are being protected, their safety is being protected. And this is actually, a, a, we have a single IRB that reviews all of the trials that are open across the health system. So it's really a unified process already to provide cancer care and ultimately to um, provide clinical trials. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do now is we have some um, clinical trials open at a few of our sites. So Mount Sinai um, Hospital is our main site for clinical research. Um, the, our Chelsea location downtown has some clinical trials as well as our Mount Sinai West location. And Mount Sinai South Nassau has actually just developed um, uh, some new clinical trials has just opened um, some trials and we'll be hopefully putting patients on those studies soon. Next, next slide. Um, next slide. One of the things that we're working on in particular is trying to make each of our sites more focused on a certain kind of um, disease or um, overall focus for their um, for their clinical trials because we know that um, it's you know we can't open every single clinical trial at every site but we want to try to make certain areas more focused. So for instance, Mount Sinai Chelsea has um, a women's cancer program. And so they have a lot of their uh, clinical trials related to breast cancer and gynecologic cancers. Eventually we hope that Mount Sinai West will become more of a, a, a site for uh, GI cancers. And that would be the focus for many of the trials there. Next slide. We also are part of a Mount Sinai Cancer Collaborative Network, which is a, um, a affiliation that we have with um, various hospitals across the whole metropolitan area, including New Jersey. And so we have several hospitals that we work very closely with to um, engage them for clinical research. And they also have an ability to send their patients to Mount Sinai to get some of the more um, cutting edge research, like for our phase one, early phase trials that uh, may not be open at their site. So this is another way that we can engage more of our um, patients across um, the whole New York City and metropolitan area in clinical research. Next slide. And in particular, we've been very uh, working very closely with the um, with Bronx Care, 
with uh, Brooklyn Hospital Center to be able to um, develop more relationships with these groups to, to um, you know, not, if it's not uh, trials doing interventions like drug trials, we can also do survey studies and um, other screening studies like we heard about um, in terms of doing lung screening. So these, all of these things, even lung screening had to come about through clinical trials. Next slide. So what are the, what's the value of really expanding access to cancer clinical trials? I mean, for Mount Sinai, one thing is really expanding our footprint, our reach and our impact out to our entire catchment area um, of New York City. And then another thing is we have these um, areas where we've really focused on certain uh, types of cancer. So we're developing centers of excellence at specific sites, at specific sites. And ultimately we know that improving access to these clinical trials improves equity and inclusion for our diverse patient populations and makes it so that we have minimized the, uh, one of the issues that can impact on ability to get good cancer care and that's um, not having good access. Next slide. Um, and I'll just say we are pretty uh, good right now at um, being able to have a diverse patient population involved in our clinical trials. Um, we are trying to do a little bit better with women. We have only 42% of our clinical trial accruals were women, and we're trying to improve that. And we've tried to um, promote um, more uh, clinical trials in breast and GYN cancers so we can uh, have more women involved. And for um, our overall enrollment, about 45% of our patients are um, from minority groups. And so that definitely shows that we've been uh, successful um, already at engaging our patient populations, our very diverse patient populations. Next slide. But we still think we can do better. Um, and this is just showing that over the last five years, we've been, um, you know, at least 40% of our accruals um, or more have been amongst our minority uh, communities. Next slide. Um, and here uh, we've been trying to be more thoughtful and strategic and trying to improve um, our uh, expand, you know, expanding our access. Um, so right now we, we, this is a, a slide just showing the, um, cancer treatment trials at each of our sites. So at Mount Sinai hospital, we have almost 400 different trials open at downtown at Chelsea and, we, and the, on the West side, we have about 60 and 40, uh, uh, trials open. And at some of our other sites, we have, um, either, you know, very few or no trials open. So we're really going to um, try to look at each of our sites and think about, what are the appropriate studies to start opening at those sites? Next slide. And so we've looked at our, um, our providers, our faculty at each of the sites and looked at their expertise. Um, so we wanna align the types of trials that we open with some of their expertise and the patients that they're seeing. Next slide. We're also looking at the um, patient populations at each of the sites to understand what are the most common um, cancers that they're seeing that would be most appropriate um, to uh, address with uh, various trials that we could open. Next slide. But we want to, you know, really look at, and I think, um, you know, Mike really explained, you know, nicely why it's so important to really align yourself with the needs of your community. So this is the really the most important thing in, in being able to expand access. Next slide. So um, in order to better understand the needs of our communities, we've been looking at, uh, we've been uh, setting up a clinical trial knowledge and attitude survey. And this is, uh, these are the different uh, hospitals that we have involved. Next slide. And the goal is to really understand the knowledge of attitudes toward and willingness to participate in clinical trials at Mount Sinai health system sites in a diverse patient population, identify potential barriers to enrollment and inform plans to eventually build infrastructure to help patients access clinical trials at our sites outside of Mount Sinai health system, uh, Mount Sinai um, main camp campus. Next slide. So we're um, going to have uh, 250 patients surveyed at the various sites on um, either iPad or paper. Next slide. And our goal is really to be able to address this in a, in a very um, multi-level way. So we know that under enrollment is in itself a healthcare disparity that really results from some of these issues with you know, policies, practices, and barriers um, both at the system level, individual level, and even in discussions between patients and doctors. Next slide. So by improving patient knowledge, their attitudes and self-efficacy and willingness to participate, um, we hope that that will be um, part of the uh, improvement in, in actual trial accrual. 
But we also need to have this multi-targeted approach to look at you know, barriers at the patient level, physician level, healthcare system, and even the clinical trial design level. And really, we hope that through this ability to you know, integrate um, information from our patients, our uh, providers, we can really improve um, our ability to uh, provide the right uh, trials and um, accrue more patients to studies across the health system. Next slide. Um, just one more plug that I want to say that we're excited about um, within, uh, there's a, a whole rigorous process for reviewing clinical trials and the, um, as I mentioned, and um, one of the steps is called the Protocol Review and Monitoring Committee. And we've just appointed some citizen scientists who came through the um, collaboration with our COE partners um, to identify um, community members who can actually review clinical trials, the, especially our investigator initiated clinical trials. So these are our new um, PRMC citizen scientists, and we're very excited to have their unique perspe perspective added to our overall process of looking at um, opening clinical trials. So next slide. And I think that's it. Um, this is it. Um, we just hope that by you know, continuing to invest in the future, we can educate our patients about the role of clinical trials and address concerns, educate our phys physicians and staff about the benefits of clinical trials. Um, we continue to need to have more staff to support our clinical trial work. And we want to find ways to make participating in clinical trials more practical, practical and minimize burdens on patients and ultimately use new technology to streamline processes for our physicians, staff, and patients. Next slide. And our goal over time is to increase our clinical trial accrual. These are the numbers of patients that were accrued over the last um, seven years or so. We dropped a little bit in 2020 and 2021. Next slide, because of COVID. And our goal is to get back on track with about a 20% growth in accruals per year. Next slide. And we hope to do that by inc increasing the number of patients that are accrued from outside of the um, main hospital from what we have now about 10% to 40%. But we can only do that by um, understanding what the barriers are and, and improving our ability for um, patients to understand um, the needs. Okay, and next slide. So thank you. And I think that's my, I'm open to questions. Yeah. Um, so one question that we had for you, um, you spoke a little bit about involving community voice in the study protocol review. Can you talk a little bit more about why community feedback is so important in that process? Yeah, thank you. So I, you know, one of the things that um, oftentimes we lose sight of when we're proposing trials, and this is in particular um, for studies that we're developing on our own, you know, from our, our own investigators actually can develop trials. Um, those are called investigator initiated trials. We also get trials, um, you know, from our pharmaceutical sponsors who have trials that they are doing. Um, but what we're really interested in getting our community um, uh, citizen scientists to help give feedback on our on our investigator initiated trials, because sometimes it is easy to lose sight of, oh, it's, is this gonna be something that a patient wants to participate in? Say, you know, if there's multiple biopsies that are, are being requested, you know, do patients really wanna do that kind of thing? Is, are there things that might be barriers to patients to being on trial? So getting the patient perspective on what the impact of being on that trial would be um, on them and whether that would be feasible for them to um, be a part of the study is really important. Um, and also, I think another important thing is when our um, community members know what's going on and understand what the, the process is, they can go out and you know, speak about it to um, you know, other stakeholders out in the community to really spread the word about you know, how rigorous this process is and you know, to be, you know, understand we're not, um, we're not doing this with you know, minimal thought. There's a lot of work that goes into vetting any of these trials that are open through the system. And finally, once trials are open, they can be you know, real um, advocates for uh, you know, getting patients to join these clinical trials. They can you know, go out and speak about the studies, be um, you know, uh, activists in the community to um, get the word out. I agree, that's so important. And thank you so much again for your presentation. Um, our next presenter will be Dr. Nihal Mohammed. The associate pro she's an associate professor of psychology and director of health disparity research in the Department of Urology at Mount Sinai. She is also director of evaluation and training for the Center for Scientific Diversity at Mount Sinai, and she is a member of the Cancer Prevention and Control Program. Just another quick reminder: if you have any questions, you can always type them in the Q and A, and we will try to answer them in our Q and A section. So, welcome, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure 
to be here today and to be able to share some of my research findings on the unmet needs of uh, prostate cancer patients. Uh, next, please. So uh, as we know, prostate cancer, uh, next, please. As we know, prostate cancer is one of the uh, most common cancers affecting men in the United States. Um, close to 270,000 new cases of prostate cancer are expected in this year alone. Uh, factors uh, of prostate cancer include older age, family history, uh, and racial background. However, the five-year survival rates are really high uh, for men uh, if and when they're diagnosed with early stage prostate cancer. Next, please. Um, we also know that uh, several treatment options are available for men diagnosed with early stage prostate cancer, including active treatment, such as surgery and radiation therapy, and observational strategies, such as active surveillance. Recent studies, however, showed evidence uh, of overtreatment among men receiving surgery uh, for early stage prostate cancer, leading to a potentially avoidable decrease in patients' quality of life because of the side effects related to surgery, such as uh, urinary incontinence and sexual dysfunction, in addition to an increase in healthcare costs. Next, please. Uh, ideally, active surveillance protocol involves identification of men with low risk or an early stage prostate cancer uh, based on uh, prostate specific antigen tests and, bio and biopsy results. Um, so these tests are really important to identify men with low risk prostate cancer. Also rigorous monitoring for cancer progression over time and countering anxiety with education and social support uh, provided to these men to help them stay on the active surveillance protocol. Uh, in addition to providing appropriate and timely treatment when these men experience cancer progression and metastasis. Next, please. So here at Sinai, uh, our active surveillance protocol offered to these men include uh, PSA testing every three months, digital rectal exam every three months, repeat biopsy every three years, in addition to multi-parametric imaging, if PSA test scores are high and biopsy test results are negative. Next, please. So uh, recent studies also show that although physicians really believe that active surveillance is effective, only a minority of these uh, physicians are uh, offered to their uh, patients. And the reasons for this uh, discordance um, include the absence of standardized patient selection criteria for active surveillance, also lack of standardized active surveillance protocol used commonly by clinical institutions and hospitals across the US and even globally. Also familiarity with one's own clinic, uh, clinical specialties such, such as surgery or radiation therapy, in addition to limited data on the long-term outcomes of patients on active surveillance. Next, please. We have uh, conducted a qualitative assessment of patients' unmet needs supported by uh, a grant received from the Department of Defense to help really understand what are the major unmet needs of men on active surveillance. So we have recruited 28 patients from Sinai um, catchment areas in Brooklyn, Bronx, uh, Staten Island, and Queens. And our sample um, included uh, men ranging in age between 54 years to 73 years. The majority were married and self-identified as Caucasian and heterosexual. We conducted uh, individual interviews with these patients and used recommended qualitative data assessment to understand the major issues that these men struggled with. When they, are, when they were on active surveillance protocol. Next, please. So um, as you see here in this table, uh, we have um, 
provided uh, some of the results that we have um, collected uh, from analyzing this data. And if you look at the first column, we found that 89% of these men reported a need for information about active surveillance as indicated by searching the internet or talking to other patients or seeking a second opinion or even reading medical journals and newsletters to understand you know, a major challenge related to active surveillance. 96% reported a need for emotional support around issues related to concerns and worries and stress uh, related to living with cancer and also keeping up with the follow-up appointments uh, regarding the PSA testing and, and other tests that they have to go um, to undergo uh, because of the commitment to the long-term um, active surveillance protocol. 79% uh, of uh, these men reported need for emotional support and expressed as the need to engage family caregivers um, and family, other family members in the decisions about active surveillance. All patients have some um, issues and challenge related to need for support with keeping up with the frequent appointments and side effects from the biopsy in addition to the management of other existing health issues. Next, please. So uh, here is a statement uh, shared by one of our patients. He, he said that the major concern was by going on active surveillance, you remove an opportunity for curing prostate cancer if your symptoms accelerate and it's determined later that you need surgery, that the prognosis is not as good as it would have been if you have addressed it early on. Next, please. So when we ask those patients about what they recommend uh, for improving care and support, um, all of them have shared some suggestions and recommendations for newly diagnosed patients considering active surveillance, including the need to be completely confident and committed, keeping track of all appointments and test results, finding a doctor that they can trust and feel comfortable with. All patients also recommended some sort of uh, educational tools and materials to help them understand this protocol better or use a, a follow-up care plan to document their clinical test results and current history. Uh, they also suggested that these brochures or educational tools should be translated in various languages, including Spanish. And 61% also recommended that patients on active surveillance should have access to a nutritionist, a physical activity program or smoking cessation program to help them really have some sort of control, at least on their lifestyle with the goal to improve their um, future uh, cancer prevention issues and also improve their health uh, in general. Next, please. Another statement from one of uh, our patients uh, who stated that if you are going to consider active surveillance, you have to be committed. It's not always going to be convenient, but you have to make sure to see a doctor every three months and so on. Next, please. So uh, guided by this knowledge we have gained from our qualitative assessment, we designed a one hour session with the clinical research coordinator uh, followed by a phone call to really help patients understand better active surveillance protocol and the need to uh, commit to the long-term follow-up care if they made that choice. And also we provided a tailored care plan um, in paper format to help patients and physicians keep track of patients' um, test results and for the patients and their families also to understand more about their test scores and the next follow-up appointment. During that meeting, we also discussed potential barriers to active surveillance protocol, screen patients for psychological distress and unmet needs, and provided referrals to Sinai support resources, as well as other support resources existing online uh, and in the community, such as the American Cancer Society support resources. Next, please. So um, this figure describes um, results of uh, 18 patients who participated um, in our baseline survey 
and then the one hour session with the research coordinator followed by the two months follow up call and th a three months survey asking them about how what do they think about the intervention and the follow up call did the intervention help them in any way and as you see here more than half of the sample reported improved knowledge about cancer care improved communication uh, decreased anxiety feeling more confident about being on active surveillance and that the session clarified their values and preferences they have gained more knowledge about the active surveillance protocol and also how to manage their existing symptoms including distress anxiety and incontinence next please so in summary our intervention was acceptable and feasible however there are several issues that remain to be addressed, including lack of timely access to patients' clinical history and current clinical tests, uh, and also a lack of personalized care management of interfering symptoms such as incontinence or sexual dysfunction, in addition to the need for optimizing and tracking adherence to surveillance protocol and supportive care resources in our patient population. Next, please. So um, this study will not be a success without the support I received from my research team, my research coordinator, the patients and their family members who participated in the study, as well as the general support of the Department of Defense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions for you. And um, wanted to ask, has Mount Sinai implemented any of the patient recommendations that you had mentioned in the presentation? That's a great, yes. So uh, through discussions uh, with Dr. Ash Tiwari, um, our active, active survey patients now have access to a dietitian who support them with change in lifestyle, in diet and nutrition as needed. Great. Um, given the challenges around the patient participation in active surveillance, um, what are the ways that Mount Sinai can optimize and track adherence? So I believe one of the major ways is to provide patients and family caregivers with access to electronic medical records that include specific information about the patient care plan, including those tests and the meaning of PA test score and biopsy test score. And uh, I have the honor and pleasure of collaborating with Mr. Jean-Claude Noel, one of the uh, scientific, uh, one of the is a scientist uh, who are current, who's currently helping me with analyzing this data to really understand better how Sinai could really provide better intervention to help patients stay on active surveillance protocol. I invite you, Jesse, to add more to this discussion if you have uh, any. Yes, thank you, Nihal. Yes, just, you know, some of the things which apply to active surveillance, in fact, apply to cancer care in general. And uh, when I was hearing uh, Colette Smith uh, saying, you, my journey is not your journey, I think that's, that's a good place to start. It starts with the patient. So whatever provides support to the patient, like active surveillance protocol with enough frequency of visits, frequency is important so that patients who face uncertainty do not have too much of a chance to actually just drop the active surveillance. Uh, things like a tailored care plan is also very important. And more generally, it's being able to address uh, educational needs and navigation. Navigation is key. It's not just navigation within the cancer spectrum. It's really through the continuum of care, which for most patients is not limited, unfortunately, to cancer. So these aspects really having, and it addresses some very basic principle which come from, which translate in the interviews very clearly. One is trust. Trust is not granted. There is a huge issue of trust deficit, generally speaking, with the medical system. So being able to give the time to build trust, allow people to express themselves, to listen to them. It sounds like basic. Yes, of course, we should do that. But when it's not done, that's when patients actually lose the sense of confidence and they lose what uh, Mike referred to, which is being engaged 
and, uh, and feeling valued. If you can get the patient to be in that space, active surveillance is going to be a lot easier. So there are a number of ways to actually just, but navigation in different ways, having somebody for the patient to speak to is really key. And uh, it, it has to be a one point of contact if possible, as close as possible to this. Great, thank you again to Dr. Mohammed and Jean-Claude for sharing with us. Um, we're going to move to our next presenter and that is Dr. Emily Gallagher, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Endocrinology, Diabetes and Bone Disease. She established an onco-endocrinology clinical practice at Mount Sinai where she treats the endocrine and metabolic complications of cancer and its therapies. She is a member of the Cancer Mechanisms Program. And I just wanna make one more plug. You're putting some great questions in the Q&A. And so we will do our best to answer them in the Q&A or to ask the presenters directly. So um, welcome Dr. Gallagher. Thank you very much, Alison, um, and thank you for the opportunity to um, talk about what I do here at Man Sinai. So um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is diabetes and obesity um, and how it is related to breast cancer, particularly. Um, I'm an endocrinologist, and so this is um, obviously people always ask, why do I study cancer? I'm an endocrinologist, but I have an interest in both the clinical aspect and also the basic science aspect. And so from the clinical perspective, I think um, what we all want to do is have people get optimized for their uh, cancer treatment. And so one of the important parts of being an endocrinologist is that we want to kind of reduce the number of interruptions to cancer treatment, and we want to reduce the number of side effects. And so part of my job as a clinical endocrinologist is to essentially hopefully minimize some of the side effects um, that patients get from a metabolic perspective. Um, you can go on to the next slide. So this is sort of an overview of what I do. So essentially, this is me in the middle, um, representation of me. Um, and so my clinical practice is onco-endocrinology, which is an emerging practice. Um, we had one of the first um, onco-endocrinology clinical practices outside a cancer center, like a specific cancer hospital. Um, and a lot of my interest in endocrine is in obesity and diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And then my research is actually um, a lot of translational and preclinical research, including doing animal research. And also um, the clinical research or the preclinical research involves how obesity and diabetes actually worsen cancer outcomes. Uh, next slide. So unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to give you a little um, overview of kind of the mechanisms in order to understand what I do. So how are diabetes and obesity linked to breast cancer specifically? So uh, you can click on the next bit. So women with obesity and diabetes actually have a higher risk of developing breast cancer. And, this has been known for a number of years. Um, traditionally, it was thought that obesity contributed to postmenopausal breast cancer. But as time has gone on, it actually emerges that um, premenopausal women who are obese have a higher risk of triple negative breast cancer, which is the hormone receptor negative breast cancers that tend to be more aggressive and have worse outcomes. Uh, next slide. So then women with obesity um, and diabetes, uh, as I said, can also develop these more aggressive types of breast cancer. And this means that there's a higher risk of uh, developing metastasis. And then you can click again. And then some uh, breast cancer treatments can cause weight gain and worsen diabetes control. So traditionally, um, we think of some of the hormone therapies. So women uh, who have postmenopausal hormone receptor positive breast cancers will get hormonal therapies. And these have been known for a significant amount of time in um, that they will worse, uh, they will cause weight gain in women. And this is a, a side effect that people will often complain of. Um, but there are new targeted therapies that also contribute to weight gain and worsening diabetes control. So some of the things are, are related to specific targets in the cancer that are being treated by specific drugs. But when you give this drug to a person um, in, in a, like as a pill and it goes to every organ, then it can actually cause a worsening of the whole body metabolism. Uh, next. And then the unfortunate thing is obesity and diabetes can actually worsen the responses to treatment. And in certain situations, uh, it's hypothesized at least that they can cause resistance to certain cancer treatments and also increase the risk of recurrence uh, and worse outcomes down the line. So there is this vicious cycle between obesity, increasing the risk of cancer, potentially contributing to worse uh, types of cancer, Potentially, um, the treatments for the cancer, unfortunately, worsening the, uh, worsening the metabolic syndrome and this kind of resulting in this evil cycle. Uh, next. 
So how does obesity impact New Yorkers? So New York is not the same as the rest of the U.S. in many ways, and the obesity rates are less. Um, there is only 26% of uh, people in New York are obese, uh, which is lower than the rest of the population uh, in the U.S. 31% are overweight, um, and 43% are uh, of neither nor uh, overweight or obese. Um, the right-hand side here, I've specifically taken the data for uh, women um, in New York particularly, and this is to highlight that um, the prevalence of obesity is not equally affecting every uh, racial or ethnic group. And so you can see that some of uh, the populations have rates of obesity up to 40%, and it can be as low as 23% in New York. So it's important to recognize that these, um, the rates of obesity are different. And in actual fact, there are different rates of specific types of breast cancer, including this triple negative breast cancer um, in black, non-Hispanic women. Um, and this has been associated with the higher rates of obesity in premenopausal women. Next. So diabetes then um, has a lower prevalence than obesity, um, but still affects uh, different populations in different ways. And so you can see again that the white population tends to have lowest rates of diabetes compared to others. And it's also important to notice that not everybody who is obese actually develops diabetes. And similarly, not everybody who has diabetes is obese. And so these two conditions can affect people in different ways, but both can contribute to worse cancer outcomes. Next. So how are obesity and diabetes related to cancer? And so this is really um, gets to what I study um, in both in people and in our preclinical work. So weight gain, um, you can click next, um, will increase what we consider as visible fat. And I'm gonna call it visible and invisible fat, but essentially what people notice themselves when they put on weight is that they'll complain of an increase in weight often around the abdomen. And this is particularly common in hormone uh, treated women with breast cancer and also post-menopause. Um, also people who get steroids for as part of their chemotherapy will tend to put on weight around their abdomen. Next. So what people don't see then is that you actually, if, if you're accumulating fat around the abdomen, what you don't often see is that you often can accumulate fat around other organs, including the liver. And this will result in um, stress in the body. Next. Um, and increase the cholesterol level. So when the liver becomes fatty, it puts out more cholesterol and this will basically increase uh, circulating cholesterol levels. The obesity in the fat and other organs will basically cause pancreatic stress. And over time, this causes what we call insulin resistance or high insulin levels, next. And then um, over time, basically you can only compensate for a certain amount of time with uh, these high cholesterol and high insulin levels, next. And so the next thing that happens is basically uh, hyperglycemia develops and all of these things together, you can click next, will basically contribute to an increased risk of cancer. Next. So what we specifically study in our preclinical work is the effects of high insulin or insulin resistance and high cholesterol, which um, is a specific type of high cholesterol, which is called dyslipidemia, which actually uh, worsens uh, cancer growth and cancer outcomes. Next. So I'm just going to give you an overview of one uh, study that we did in women with breast cancer um, and then just what our preclinical work is related to this. So along with Nina Bikal um, and Derek Leroyth here at the Tish Cancer Institute, we did this cross-sectional study where we um, identified women with newly diagnosed breast cancer. They all uh, generously uh, allowed us to take some fasting blood tests and they also gave us um, tissue, breast tissue from their surgical resections. So what we saw here was um, we were looking at basically whether the insulin resistance or this high hyperinsulinemia would contribute to a worse outcome um, or a worse prognosis in breast cancer. And so on the left here is what's called HOMA IR. So this is a, um, a way of measuring insulin res resistance or high insulin levels. And what you can see here is that the self-identified black women had a higher insulin resistance than the white women in the study. And then you can click next. So then we wanted to know if this was associated with a worse prognosis. And so what we did see was that black women, 28% had a worse prognosis breast cancer. And this NPI score is just a, a Nottingham prognostic index score. It's basically a calculation of um, breast cancer prognosis. So there were many more women, uh, black women who had a worse prognosis than white women. 
And when we examined if the insulin resistance was associated with the worst prognosis, we did uh, find that there was significant mediation of worst prognosis from the insulin resistance. Next. So what do we do in the lab then to kind of understand what's going on here? So as I mentioned, uh, these women who participated in the study allowed us to have samples of their breast cancer specimens. And so with the breast cancer specimens, we can actually do staining for things that are not done in normal clinical care. So our interest again is in insulin. Well, part of our interest is in insulin signaling. So we, this is actually an example of looking at the receptor for insulin. So the thing insulin binds to and is taken up by um, when it binds to cell. So in this particular breast cancer sample, you can see that there's a lot of insulin receptors. So we think insulin is actually directly acting on uh, the insulin receptor. So that's the top left one. And I should mention the, the brown stuff is basically where the insulin receptor staining is. We then take things a little a step further. And so in our lab, we can um, we have a lot of different breast cancer cell types. And some of these are from patients directly and some of them have been established by others over many years. And so here, what you can see is, uh, so the blue dot is uh, the center of the nucleus of the cell and all the red dots are actually lipids or cholesterol that have been taken up by the tumor cells. So we can actually study in great detail um, how breast cancer cells will take up cholesterol and which cholesterols they'll take up. The next thing we do is we can actually break it down even further. So we have access to um, what we call like omics analysis. And so people do this in different ways. You can do detailed examinations of, um, of like genes or mutations in cells. What we look at in great detail is what exactly these lipids are. So if you've ever had your, your cholesterol levels drawn or your lipid panel done, you'll see that there's a total cholesterol and then there's what somebody will call the good and the bad cholesterol. Um, these can actually, you can break these lipid panels down actually if you look in enough detail into literally hundreds of different lipid types. And so those cholesterols, if you look at your bad cholesterol or your LDL cholesterol, that's actually made up of cholesterol plus a whole load of other types of fatty acids and different molecules. And so we look in great detail at exactly what's involved in these cholesterols and uh, lipids and how they can be affecting tumor growth. So we have identified certain types of lipids. Um, this is just uh, a model of cholesterol, this picture down the bottom right. And then we go back to our animal models and we can actually generate animal models that specifically overexpress a gene that will increase a certain type of cholesterol or knock out a gene that will basically reduce that specific amount of cholesterol in the circulation. And very recently, we've uh, come across some very interesting data showing that in our animal models where there are specifically high triglyceride levels, um, we see a dramatic increase in the number of lung metastases that we're seeing. And then when we take one specific gene that modifies cholesterol and knock it out in the animal models, we actually dramatically reduce the lung metastasis. So this is sort of how we take things from the patient um, to the very much molecular level and then br bring it into our preclinical models in order to really understand what's going on in this uh, situation of obesity and breast cancer. And so I think you can go on to the next slide. So with that, I just want to acknowledge everybody, obviously the women who participated in our research, there were more than a thousand women who donated fasting blood samples to us for our analysis and also allowed us to analyze their breast cancers. Um, our collaborators, um, particularly Nina Bickel and Derek Leroy, who um, were the leaders of the breast cancer study that I was involved in, um, Ramon Parsons, who has supported me through my development from a clinician to a physician scientist. Um, and then the members of our lab, like uh, Tiff and Abora, who've done a lot of the preclinical work we've recently done. The Tish Cancer Institute uh, took a chance on me as a physician who knew nothing about basic science and decided to, um, to support me, to uh, see me through to um, uh, K08 and soon to be R01 funding from the NIH. So thank you very much. And I'm very happy to take questions. It's wonderful news and congratulations. And thank you for your presentation. Um, what can people do to disrupt the cycle and decrease the risk for breast cancer? So with um, obesity and insulin resistance, it's, uh, you know, there's, it's difficult to treat, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of factors. If there was a kind of an easy solution to obesity, we wouldn't have an obesity epidemic across the US, but um, there are a number of things that people can do. Um, you know, kind of lifestyle intervention is still kind of the mainstay of treatment with, um, you know, diet and exercise. There are new therapies that are coming through that we're using for the management of 
um, you know, diabetes and obesity in patients who don't have cancer, but it might be at higher risk. Um, and so there are new pharmacological agents coming through that can also help with, um, you know, with weight reduction that can reduce the risk of developing cancer. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we'll just keep our eyes on the Q&A box in case people type them in there because we've been getting some great questions. So thank you again to Dr. Gallagher for your presentation. Our next and final presenter is Dr. Samir Parekh. He is the Director of Myeloma Translational Research and Professor in Hematology, Oncology, and Oncological Science at Mount Sinai. He has a translational research focus on the immunogenomics of myeloma and B cell malignancies. And Dr. Parikh is also a member of Cancer Immunology and Cancer Clinical Investigation Programs. I now um, welcome Dr. Parekh. Thank you, Allison, uh, Cardi, and organizers for inviting me to uh, share our uh, program on behalf of the myeloma group. Uh, we have 10 physicians and large uh, team of scientists and clinical staff. Uh, so this is really uh, on behalf of a lot of uh, people. And I think it is well poised uh, to come right after Dr. Gallagher's talk uh, on obesity and breast cancer, because uh, I will be talking about uh, some modifiable risk factors as well, uh, similar to Emily. Uh, in my case, it will be about diabetes and uh, multiple myeloma. Next slide, please. So first, a word about uh, myeloma and uh, our program at Sinai. So myeloma is a blood cancer that uh, is seen usually in older adults where people can present with uh, an abnormal protein in the blood and then progressively get low blood counts uh, and in, in later stages, even fractures and kidney failure. And uh, we are one of the largest centers in uh, not just New York, but probably a tri-state area that uh, treats this with over 600 new patients every year being referred to us and a total pool of over 3000 patients that we take care of. On the right, you will see a um, pie chart which shows that the majority of the patients are actually non-white uh, population and myeloma disproportionately affects um, African-Americans. And I'll go into that in detail in, in a couple of slides. Next slide. Our program has uh, over the years participated in the approval of several drugs listed on the top left here. And uh, the reason we have been able to do this is thanks to the participation of our patients into clinical trials. So uh, compared to some other cancers, our clinical trials actually work a dual purpose by actually extending the survival of these patients to get on to the next drug that is in development. And in that way, I've had patients, I uh, referred to our program leader, Dr. Jagannath, uh, almost a decade ago that have gone on from one trial to the other and benefited from it, living a, a very uh, long and, and happy life thanks to these uh, clinical trials. and and. This is making it a treatable cancer. And this is an important thing because we need to recognize and diagnose these patients so we can uh, ap appropriately treat them. Uh, the uh, participation of African-American patients in clinical trials in our program is very high. As you can see on the slide, it's almost 18%. This in comparison to other institutions where typically the number is around 5%, is almost threefold, and we would like to increase it even more. Next slide. Thanks to Dr. Smith, uh, we have identified uh, that uh, the Brooklyn area, in particular in uh, New York, is one of the top 10 neighborhoods for multiple myeloma. And this is important. Next slide. Because Brooklyn has the second largest black population and this disease is twice as common in blacks as compared to caucasians 
for reasons that are still not completely known, I'm going to present one hypothesis in a couple of slides, but there have been a lot of studies that have confirmed this increase in incidence. The other population that has an increased incidence is actually uh, 9 11 uh, workers, where World Trade Center survivors have an increased incidence uh, as well, probably due to uh, the exposure. Next slide. So we have published in the past that where you live in New York impacts how you do with myeloma. And uh, this really needs our help from all of you and from the public health authorities so that we can uh, give treatment in a timely manner to the patient populations that need it the most. Next slide. A major study that came out last year showed in an eye-opening way in looking at almost 3 million people in Canada that if somebody had diabetes, their chance of getting myeloma and actually even other blood cancers was significantly higher. And in fact, if they had myeloma and diabetes, their chance of dying was 30% higher. So really, diabetes is an important comorbidity that has been under-recognized in this malignancy, much like Dr. Gallagher mentioned about obesity and breast cancer. Next slide. Looking at our own patient population, we have confirmed that the incidence of African-American patients that have myeloma and obesity or diabetes is much higher than Caucasian patients. And this is a, these are both modifiable risk factors that we can actually do something about. Next slide. Uh, thanks to Dr. Gallagher and her lab, we were actually test why this may be happening in a mouse model of pre-diabetes and diabetes that, have, that has been developed by Dr. Gallagher and, Dr. De, uh, uh, and other colleagues in endocrinology, where if we implant these mice with myeloma, they get significantly larger tumors in a short time span as compared to non-diabetic control mice. And looking deeper into why this was happening, we found that Similar to diabetic patients, there is a very high level of insulin in these mice that contributes to signaling through the insulin receptor and downstream pathways that leads to the growth of this mice. Next slide. So based on this finding, we actually went to chemists at Mount Sinai that were developing drugs against cancer and found that one of them, a drug called, uh, it has a number, uh, ON123300, was not only able to block the growth of myeloma, but also affect this pro-survival, pro-growth pathway that is there in diabetic patients and myeloma. Therefore, we have approached our patients and actually uh, even the drug company to set up a clinical trial that is specifically going to help patients with refractory myeloma that also uh, may have diabetes and take this drug forward for the treatment of patients. And I hope this will also help all the African-American patients that have diabetes and myeloma. Next slide. Besides the drug development and the insights into diabetes and myeloma, our center has several new initiatives, which I will just take a moment to explain. Uh, next slide. One of the initiatives is to get the care closer to where the patients are. To do this, we have opened two new centers, one in Chelsea, which started a couple of years ago and has a healthy growth in terms of number of patients. And the next site is one that was started in Brooklyn. And Dr. Cesar Rodriguez, who is uh, here uh, with us, is going to talk about it a little bit later when he is on the panel. 
This will allow us to deliver myeloma care at the same level that we are doing at Mount Sinai Hospital on the Upper East Side to the local populations that are affected with this disease. Next slide. Another program that we have started is a summer program for training uh, underserved undergraduate students. And this has, comes with a stipend and connects these students to labs. Uh, we, uh, next slide. We have also established a fund which actually pays for patients to come back and forth to the hospital if they are not able to afford this uh, travel. A lot of patients have very simple logistic obstacles that prevent them from getting good care or even care on clinical trials. And our partners in the pharmaceutical industries understand that this they are helping us help these patients through copay assistance and other financial remuneration uh, depending on the uh, treatment involved. Next slide. Uh, another youth training in incentive is uh, something called the Lloyd Sherman Scholars Initiative, which takes uh, more than 200 students each year and prepares them for careers in science and healthcare by partnering with uh, labs at uh, Mount Sinai and uh, scientists at Mount Sinai. Next slide. We have actually set up patient education programs as well at the Tisch Cancer Institute. One of the important ones that I'd like to mention is the BIPOC support group. This is a support group that meets on a regular basis monthly, and we invite all of you to attend it, not just myeloma patients, where we have excellent social workers and myeloma clinicians that actually come and help us educate patients and provide a support group along with other patients that are going through this journey by integrating mindfulness and meditation as well as the latest clinical information. Uh, we are actually uh, expanding this programming to even Spanish language uh, speaking patients uh, through the Red Door community. Next slide. Uh, there are a number of outreach events that have been planned along with uh, Dr. Smith and her colleagues. And this slide uh, presents one of them that uh, Dr. Cesar Rodriguez is going to do um, uh, soon. Uh, actually, sorry, it was earlier in the year. Um, and we will be doing this at, at regular intervals with the help of various organizations. Uh, next slide. We are also engaging with citizen scientists to improve and disrupt not just our research, but also our fundamental care of the patients and the education of the next generation of clinical fellows and uh, trainees. Next slide. Finally, I'd like to end by saying that we have established metrics for growth of our program in the underserved area. And we have several needs that we are uh, now approaching uh, different funding organizations to help us with. Uh, this involves getting the uh, support for research infrastructure, more patient education through patient navigators and care coordinators, and as well as health educators. Next slide. With that, I'll stop and thank the entire uh, program and uh, take questions if there are any on the chat. We did get a, a comment, not a question, but it's cool that targeting pathways for other diseases such as diabetes helps with understanding some cancers. You are awesome. Thank you. So I couldn't agree more. <laughs> you did a great job. And um, Dr. Rodriguez's presentation that you referenced is also available on our COE website because it was recorded. So anyone who missed it and is interested in viewing it, it is available there. Um, so Thank just you. to Yes, to ask you a question, does the development of myeloma depend on how well the diabetes that you mentioned is controlled? Uh, so we don't know that just yet, but we do know that if the diabetes is not well controlled when you have myeloma, uh, at least in the lab, it will help the myeloma grow faster. So controlling it makes sense. Moreover, as Dr. Gallagher mentioned, a lot of the treatments involve drugs that can make the diabetes worse. For example, we give steroids 
as a cornerstone of therapy with most myeloma drugs and steroids frequently make diabetes worse. So it's definitely a very good idea to get your diabetes in tight control if you have myeloma or its precursor disease. A lot of people actually, 5% um, of people above 70 have the precursor disease to myeloma, something called monoclonal gammopathy and also smoldering myeloma. All of these people should be careful about keeping their sugar under tight control. Thank you. There was another question I see, and it seems that diabetes has many implications for cancer. Is Mount Sinai doing anything diabetes-specific research? So Dr. Gallagher, I know that uh, there was another question posed. Maybe you want to take that one about diabetes specifically with cancer. Yeah, so we, we have a, a large um, diabetes metabolism institute as well, where there's a lot of research going on specifically um, related to diabetes and it from a different aspect, more related to like how type one diabetes develops and, and the development of type two diabetes specifically. So actually you're looking at most of the people here who are involved in uh, diabetes and cancer research. So it's, it's an emerging field. There's not as many people, you know, looking at this link, but it is um, an emerging field across the US, I would say. Great. Well, thank you so much for answering that. And um, thank you to Dr. Parikh again for your presentation. Before we take our 10 minute break, I wanna introduce Dr. Melissa Mazur, who will talk us through the word cloud that we will do during the break. Great, thank you, Dr. Snow. So we um, are just about to take a break so we can have 10 minutes to stretch, um, but at some point during the break or right before, um, if we could go ahead and we would love for everyone to fill out this word cloud. So the question is, what do you believe gets in the way of community members getting involved in cancer research? Um, and so what you can do is just um, go to your camera on the phone and then scan the QR code and it will automatically link you to this question. And then you can put in your one to two word answer and then it will start coming up on the screen so we can get a sense of what everyone's thinking in the audience. And this will be up over the next 10 minutes. Okay. Great. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you get a chance to walk around and stretch your legs a little bit. Um, thank you so much for answering this question. Um, we can see, you know, from you know those of you who probably have done these polls before, um, the questions that are most commonly provided, you know, are, are larger and more bolded. So we see here mistrust, awareness, trust, or lack of trust financial, time, vulnerability, be busy, bias, and racism. These are incredibly important points um, you know, that we continue to want to um, address and work together to overcome. I also wanna read, um, I apologize, the poll I guess closes after 40 responses. So I also wanna make sure I'm reading um, one of the attendees um, response. She said that, um, or he or she said that I would like to answer here as well. Patients may become discouraged and may be unlikely to continue their clinical trials or may avoid other support programs in their, as if their disease worsens and if their mental state deteriorates. They must have emotional and mental support along the way. And so really highlighting the supportive care of emotional and mental. Thank you, incredibly important points. Um, so I'm gonna hand it back over to Dr. Snow. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now begin with the next part of our retreat, which will consist of two roundtable discussions. Our first roundtable will be on catchment relevant research with Tisch Cancer Institute leaders. Our moderator for this roundtable will be Ms. Inez West, who is a patient advocate and also a member of our community advisory board. Our panel today includes the TCI researchers, leadership, and health educators. I will now turn it over to Inez West. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to have my six panelists take a minute each to just kind of identify themselves and something that they hope to impart to the um, discussion today. So let me start off with the Dr. Jamila Sly. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Jamilia Sly. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Population Health Science and Policy. And I am a community psychologist by training. And a lot of my research has focused on developing and testing interventions to promote health equity and cancer prevention and screening. And I hope that we can um, talk about how we can improve um, representation across um, our research altogether. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sly. Uh, Ms. Uh, Michaelia Brown, I hope I'm saying your name right. Yes, you did. Thank you. Again, as well as, um, hi, everyone. My name is Michaelia. I am a health educator and clinical research coordinator in the Department of Population Health Sciences and Policy. Um, and what I hope to bring to the discussion today is more so of a lay perspective on the community um, and their reaction to clinical trial and cancer research um, concurrently happening at TCI. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Dr. Nina Bickle, uh, your response? Is Dr. Bickle on? I don't see Dr. Bickle. Uh, let me go to Dr. Cesar Rodriguez. Hello, I am Cesar Rodriguez and I am the clinical director for the myeloma program at Mount Sinai. And I um, rec we recently opened a myeloma program at Brooklyn and I do clinical trials with early phase studies and some translational research. So I hope to um, give some information on the clinical aspect on treating myeloma and research and how well, we're trying to improve the well-being of our patients. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, Ms. Yahara Rojas. Hi, good afternoon all. Uh, my name is Yohaira Rojas and I'm one of the administrative directors here at the Department of Uro Urology, uh, working with Dr. Tuari. I oversee the prostate cancer screening mobile unit program um, with my team. I'm hoping to bring, uh, uh, if anything, learn from this uh, panel on uh, what everyone's doing. We're in the very early stages of our program. Um, so right now what I'm able to bring to the table is uh, hopefully questions uh, from you guys to help us out on how to best outreach in our community. Thank you. And Mr. Errol Webster. Yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Errol Webster. I'm the program coordinator for the mobile unit, working hand in hand with the uh, Hira Rojas. Uh, again, our program just started out in April and we're looking to, uh, basically what I want to, to bring to the table is um, just our perspective of what we're finding in the community as we just have been on a few of our events so far, uh, learning as we go along and seeing how we can impact and bring more to the table in terms of outreach and so forth. Okay, thank you very much. Question number one um, is for Dr. Jamila Sly and for Italia Brown. I understand you both work extensively with the community across New York City. Can you discuss the role of community in your work and how community-based participation can be enhanced across other types of research at CCI? In your answer, can you also discuss how community can enhance equity and address how to address social determinants of health? Whichever one of you ladies would like to go first. Okay, Leah, do you wanna go first? Sure, thanks, Jamelia. Um, So yeah, I am a health educator for the Witness Project of Harlem. And so one of my main responsibilities is providing culturally and linguistically targeted education to the Black and African-American community on some of the COE's target cancers like breast, colorectal, lung, and prostate. We also do provide education on cervical cancer. But the way that the community works in my work is in order to create these targeted education programs, we have to understand the stressors or barriers that prevent the community from accessing screenings. So why is it that a young African-American woman might not be getting her yearly mammograms or why is it that an older African-American man is not having a shared decision-making conversation with a urologist about prostate cancer and his risk for prostate cancer? And so some of the answers to these questions is simply, they don't know where to go, 
or have the assistance to get screenings done, which is why we also provide information into navigation resources during our programming, similar to um, the prostate van that Yahira and Mr. Webster have created. Um, additionally, listening to the community is one of my big um, goals is hearing their comments during the education programs, any questions or concerns, and building these relationships where I go back into these organizations again and again to hear what we can change in the programming and to make it applicable or where else they like us to go. Frequently, we'll get invites to health fairs or other larger church events um, to continue to provide this education material to other members of the community. And like I said in my introduction, um, I come from a pure perspective rather than a scientific perspective. Um, so I occupy the two identities as someone belonging to um, the African-American and Black community and practicing the cultural values. And additionally, as someone being new to the medical and scientific community. And so I, in answering the second part of the question, I think like Dr. Goodman, Mr. Altermosho, and others have said, clinical trial research and work is one of the biggest areas that pose a significant benefit to the community, yet education about this is limited. Um, so like in the community, clinical trials are seen as either like a Hail Mary or a research procedure that's only for those who are wealthy or just an imbalance of power and privilege. And so to be completely honest, the, bas the basis behind these ideas do hold merit. Clinical trials do have an associated cost, whether that's transportation, time, uh, childcare, or caregivers. Additionally, the lack of information about clinical trials allows this idea of Hail Mary to persist. And then in research trial, clinici clinicians and researchers do possess power over the data they collect for patients and even the lifestyle by which patients must abide by to qualify for these trials. So um, I believe one way to promote equity in these situations is similar to the responsibilities of a health educator by having open and honest dialogue with participants throughout the trial and afterwards, providing proper education, having large focused conversations with the community where they can raise their concerns and actually ask questions and researchers will actually listen, listen to these ideas and how to implement these changes, whether in the near future, um, and then allowing the community to hold you accountable for a certain level of communication. Um, so it's not just, a, oh, I go into the community, I do this trial and then I leave. It's I go into this community, I do this trial, I become a true partner, I return to them, give them the information of the results, and then we can continue fostering this relationship. But that is my perspective. I'll turn it over to Dr. Jamelia. Okay, uh, we're on a time limit, Dr. Sly. Is there anything that Natalia has not said that you might want to add? Um, yeah, I think, Michaela, you gave a wonderful answer, and I was going to say many of the things that you uh, were going to mention. Um, one thing that I'll just add is that uh, regarding how we can enhance equity, the second question that was posed, um, sometimes I think academic medical centers like Mount Sinai are viewed as uh, these ivory towers where you kind of need to know the right people, maybe look a certain way in order to gain access. Um, but in the community, especially in New York, it's very diverse and representative. And I think that engaging the community is really a step towards equity, but it's also really, really important that we have representation at all levels. So not just in the patient population and trying to recruit um, people of color to fill these um, uh, clinical trials, but also in the biomedical workforce as a whole. And we need more researchers, scientists, physicians, all of it, because seeing people who look like you, who are in positions of power and authority can really go a long way. And I think it makes people uh, feel like Mount Sinai could be a place that they could trust, um, that will take care of them, that will value them and care about their well being. Um, and so I think that that's something that we um, are working towards. Um, but I think that it's important that we have representation across, um, across the board. Thank you, ladies, both for your um, response to the question. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Pickle, um, let me give you a minute to introduce yourself and what do you think, hope to bring to the uh, discussion today? You need to unmute yourself. Yes, <laughs> I need a t-shirt with that written on it. Um, <laughs> I, sorry, I, after, um, anyway, I'm here, thankfully. Um, I'm Dr. Nina Bikel. I'm a professor in the Department of Population Health Science and Policy. I am a primary care physician and I've been working in the area of um, eliminating cancer disparities for a few decades and working with community in order to do that. Um, what I hope to, to bring to the conversation and talk somewhat about are ways that we can try to make it easier for people both to get care, both to get um, good high quality cancer care, 
across the spectrum, as well as reaching individuals um, throughout the community with whom we don't already have relationships and figuring out ways together that we can really maximize that so people do get the kind of care that all of us should be getting and getting it in the right time, in the right place, in the right way that fits them and does them the most good. All right, thank you very much. You arrived just in time for question number two. So between yourself and uh, say that Dr. Rodriguez, who, has, who have done extensive work in cancer clinical trials? Uh, Dr. Bickle and Rodriguez, in your work and speaking to clinical trials in general, can you discuss how well being and quality of life are addressed and prioritized in clinical trials? If you feel this area is not being addressed, please explain ways of how research can better prioritize and measure well being and quality of life in clinical, clinical trials. Who would like to go first? Um. I can do it. I'm off. Please, my dear. Is that okay, Caesar? Yes, please. Okay, great. Um, so, in clinical trials, it's actually critical across all clinical trials to ensure that, first of all, everyone is getting at a minimum the standard of care. Um, there are a lot of um, incorrect beliefs out in the community about uh, placebos meaning you're not getting any treatment versus getting an experimental treatment. So I think it's actually critical that we all know that, uh, that it, it is moral uh, not to give a standard of care. But in fact, one of our community members, when we were working together on a proposal to um, increase uh, BIPOC representation in clinical trials, um, when we were just talking through the ideas said, you know, it's not an issue of experimentation. It's the difference between, you know, just coming in and getting whatever they're going to do versus getting Rolls Royce care. So, you know, do you want a Toyota or do you want a Rolls Royce? So I thought that was um, a pretty insightful uh, way of looking at what clinical trials can bring. So all clinical trials must look at issues of well-being. Um, the challenge that we have is what is well being and how well are we measuring it? And I think that the critical role, one of the critical roles that community must play in the development of clinical trials is to ensure that in fact, the measures that are so important to, to you as an individual are actually the ones that, that the researchers are measuring. And really the best the only way to, to get to that issue is by including community from the very outset in the development of these kinds of trials, of all kinds of trials, to ensure that they're really quite patient-centered and get at, at many of these issues. And some of them had come up in that word cloud, things like financial toxicity. Um, you know, these are things that, that one might not think are, are um, examples of patient well-being, but they certainly are and must get measured. Okay, thank you. Dr. Rodriguez? So just to uh, complement um, what Nina Bickle just said is, in myeloma, we have had in the last few years a great um, number of new drugs that have come out and have been FDA approved thanks to a lot of clinical trials that we have. But we have actually noticed that it hasn't really caused a big impact in the in the black community, which is the population that gets affected by myeloma the most. And one of the things that we've noticed is that the majority of the clinical trials have less than 10% representation of the black community. And that's causing a big problem that has now led us to this awakening of how can we change this? And we are now um, more engaged in including patients in the development of clinical trials for several reasons. One is to try to figure out what the, the interest of the patients are, design a study that's more patient-centered, that is going to help uh, eliminate some of the barriers that we might be overlooking, like financial, economic, uh, distance, um, social support, that would... Uh, prevent some populations from participating in studies. But at the same time, we have realized that uh, as we're having new drugs and we're having more efficacy in the drugs that we have, 
we now are having to look into the side effects and trying to make sure that the drugs that we're using are safer than what we've used in the past, as well as more effective. So all, um, all of the clinical trials are now incorporating quality of life evaluations and wellness evaluations to make sure that the therapies that we're studying are not just more effective, but at the same time, safer or not impacting the quality of life of patients. And like Dr. Parekh mentioned earlier, um, we have changed the paradigm of how to treat patients. We're used to patients coming to big centers for clinical trials and to access to specialists. And now the idea is to try to flip it over and we go to the community and identified areas that actually need the most help, like Brooklyn in this case for multiple myeloma. And instead of having them commute for an hour and a half to get to us, we're the ones who are commuting to them and offering the specialty care and access to the clinical trials so that we can try to get them to have um, better care and try to narrow that gap that we've been seeing in outcomes in myeloma patients. Okay, thank you, Dr. Spickle and Rodriguez. Question number three is for Ms. Uh, Rojas and Mr. Webster. You have um, recently launched important work in community prostate cancer education and screening. Can you please discuss how you think community members can be helpful in cancer research and care, specifically how has community been involved in your work and what are some of the ideas of how they can be involved and contribute in meaningful ways to reach a more diverse community audience and ensure education and research is developed in a culturally and community centric manner? Good That's when we'll, go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll get started. <laughs> um, Errol, who's a great, great uh, supporter and a great teammate, um, will um, have lots to share so far with what we've learned uh, since our 4-1 launch. Um, it's been a, a learning process for us since we just got going with our mobile unit, um, kind of getting to know um, the community. Uh, the way it, it would be beneficial, um, you know, and it would, and, and they, and I believe the community is already trying to do this with us. At least we see it. Um, is their level of involvement is with opening their doors, uh, allowing us in to provide education. Uh, they are um, engaging their uh, their their members and their followers. Um, a lot of the work that we've done so far have been either. I believe she's frozen. Some housing community uh, locations. Uh, so in our local churches as well, they also get very involved in bringing in um, the folks. Um, we're learning to build our network right now. Uh, we're learning more about the, the men and what takes for them to be attracted to what we have to offer. Um, in the month of May so far, since we went live, we have done at least nine events so far with at least maybe 20, 25% of those members, of those patients needing follow-up care uh, based on the work, that, uh, on the analysis done by the provider. Um, and and we're, we're learning um, that the, the, the best way for us to do that is to provide um, uh, a group of team members, uh, you know, as it was said here before, that look like the, the community, to engage the community, um, to, to bring them in. And Errol can tell you, we just did a recent um, uh, event in um, Brooklyn uh, this weekend. Um, and he can tell you a little bit more about how uh, that particular uh, church and uh, community members uh, reacted to, to our presence there. Sure, thanks, Rihara. Yeah, so um, we went out on Sunday, just yesterday, and at first, when well, we found we the, the reception was a little slow at first, obviously. Uh, we we found over the nine events that we've done that, based on maybe some of the reactions that came on the, in the poll, that we are getting a, quite a bit of resistance in terms of stigma, myths uh, surrounding prostate cancer um, screening, 
and so forth. So we're on the ground while we're speaking with uh, potential patients or you know, people who would, would, would be screening, we're, we're having to speak with them, try to maybe overcome some of the, you know, the, the myths and the, the, the stigmas that they would have otherwise and get them comfortable enough to be able to come and say, hey, let's, let's get you screened, you know, see what's going on. Hopefully they, they'll, they'll maybe tell other people to come and, and, and screen also. Um, I've been working with a lot of, um, of the community-based organizations, getting calls and emails from them, setting up the appointments, speaking with them and getting their perspective as to how, you know, how they can help us help the community. So that's that's some of the um, what we've, we've encountered so far. Okay, thank you. There are um, about three questions in the Q, the Q and A. Allison, you want to handle those, or you want me to do it? You can go ahead. Okay, we have a question that it's important to test the QOL measures and PROs associated with a particular protocol, so that patients can better weigh the risks versus benefits of using the protocol. Any particular response to that from any of the panels? Is that, is that specific, a, 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 that a clinical specific question to, to prostate cancer or a urology uh, question? I, I think it, it was a generalized question, I think. I'm not sure if it was meant for which particular group. Yeah. It says Mount Sinai uh, Media Service is gonna answer this question is yes, it, it's um i'm happy to give it a try but caesar i i think cynthia asked and i'm sure it's, it's likely related to myeloma if you want to take a shot otherwise i'll wait it's, so the quality of life um surveys and evaluations that we do are specific to the disease and the treatment that we're giving and uh, it's gonna it's hard to compare quality of life one cancer compared to another cancer so each special, each type of cancer has their own uh, questions that we try to implement throughout all of the studies and try to standardize them so that if we're doing a study here or there's a study being done at another facility with a different drug, that we use similar questionnaires so that we can compare quality of life metrics between different studies and between different drugs. But it, it is disease specific. I don't know if that helps answer the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the next one is, the panel is incredibly useful and important to see how you are centering community work and addressing disparities in care. Thank you. And this one is, how can the community hear more about these events if we want to share them or come to them? I, I can answer that portion, at least for us, for the mobile unit. Um, we, we are, um, we have a website and we have brochures and we have information. Um, we've getting a lot of, um, requests through, uh, emails. Some patients are looking for us directly or where we're going to be. Um, I, I think with there, there is some, um, parts there where we can perhaps, I, I'm always thinking in this way, uh, with this resource group here, with this team on this panel, perhaps there's a way that we can have a, uh, those of us in the community sort of a centralized um, uh, way to share uh, internally, right, with our Sinai commu uh, community, as well out, you know, in our, in our local areas. Uh, to send out that information um, uh, for folks to know where we are and where we're going to be. As of right now, our website um, is what we have, and we're working on developing a more um, cohesive sort of intake process as well for the mobile unit um, so that we can know where we're needed. Uh, but I think there could be some way that as a group, we can kind of push out all this um, uh, great information that, and, and great resource that we have to offer sort of like a conglomerate for the community. I've learned that in this um, uh, world, uh, I've come from every operational uh, front end administrative. Uh, it's my first time working in community outreach uh, that I, I myself didn't realize how many great people within the same Sinai institution were doing so many amazing things. I kind of uh, learned them as I went along. 
uh, so many people doing so many great things sort of silo. So uh, a group like this and us coming together to inform the community, I think that we can kind of uh, consolidate it all and get it out there. I'd actually okay. like to turn the question back to the community members who are, who are on the line right now, because this is a really critical question that we struggle with all the time of what's really the best way to get the word out and get the word to the people who, who want it, who need it. Um, what, would, what would work best for you? Um, how can we do this? So I, I, I mean, I, you don't need to answer right now, but it would be really helpful to get your inputs on that, especially in a world in which we're all inundated with messaging constantly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Bickle. That's a very good idea. I have one last, uh, I don't know if it's quite a question, but it's perhaps the panel can comment on the incorporation of patient reported outcomes, PRO. Any takers? Maybe so we, we haven't, we have uh, incorporated in our clinical trials journals where each month when people come, they bring their journal and we ask, we, before we start a study, we teach them how to journal and document symptom signs, uh, when they got a medication, want to help with compliance and make sure they don't forget to take medication, but at the same time, Whenever we're seeing patients, we don't see patients on a daily basis. And by the time they come to see us, they might have forgotten a symptom or they might have changed uh, the concept of the duration. So having proper journaling could be a good way of uh, patient reported outcomes. And that tends to improve the quality of the studies and have a, a more reliable uh, outcomes. Okay, thank you. I know as a patient, I use my chart extensively and whenever I have a doctor's visit, I always make note of a number of different things. Or if I have questions that I come up during the week or prior, I make sure I write it down for that day of the visit so that when I'm at the doctor's office, whatever I need to ask a question about, I find out more information about, that's there. So perhaps that might be a helpful way to let patients and people that you're in the community know if you can keep a written uh, journal or have a particular area where you write down notes or questions that you have. Perhaps it might have been an article you read and that might have, you have questions about maybe the medication or the treatment that is being given. Will that work for me? So maybe that's another way of getting your patients, as you said, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, to keep track of what's going on, medications, because a lot of times you're on one medication and seeing a specialist and specialists aren't talking to each other. And therefore, you might be on one medication that might be affected by something another doctor will put you on. Anyone has any last words before we kind of end up? Thank you all for being here and responding and look forward to working with you as a member of the community. Thank you. Thank you all <clears throat> to all our panelists um, for this insightful discussion and to Ms. West for moderating. Our second roundtable discussion will be a Q&A with, with the TCI director and leaders, a health educator and community members. The moderator for this roundtable will be Ms. Betsy Smith, another member of our community advisory board and the program director of Henry Street Settlement, Nork, Bladeck Cares. Welcome, Betsy. Hi, thanks, Dr. Snow. So um, welcome to everyone and thanks for attending this roundtable discussion on the topic of future directions within the Tisch Cancer Institute Research Program. This panel features leaders in the cancer care across all research and education programs at Mount Sinai's Tisch Cancer Institute. So each member will introduce themselves and briefly in about a minute or less, um, tell us a little bit about your work and after that, we will begin our roundtable discussion. And please remember to send any questions in the Q&A box. So I'm going to first call on Dr. Ramon Parsons to introduce himself. Yeah, hi, hi. Uh, it's Ramon Parsons here. Uh, I'm the director of the Tisch Cancer Institute, and I have a research laboratory. I have a background in, in cancer genetics and studying uh, how genes are mutated 
uh, in cancer cells uh, to cause cancer growth. And uh, pertinent to today's topics that we heard, um, uh, the, the genes that I study uh, are that are mutated often um, in, in a variety of different cancers actually are part of the machinery inside a cell to respond to insulin. Uh, and uh, these different components are usually changed uh, in the cancer cells. So they're stuck in the on position uh, so that uh, creating uh, this uh, exaggerated insulin signal uh, in, in the cancer cells, which improves their uh, fitness, you know, not in a good way, in a bad way to grow better and survive um, uh, better than, than a normal cell would. Uh, so that's sort of a brief, brief overview. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Dr. Parsons. And next we have Ms. Larika Miller. Hi, Therica Miller, I'm the Executive Director of Enterprise uh, Clinical Research at the Cancer Institute. And my role really is to help our physician scientists and our patients identify appropriate clinical trials and to uh, really take care of a lot of the behind the scenes paperwork and regulatory items uh, that help us bring these trials to our community members and then to use the results of those trials to inform medicine and the future treatments for patients. Very good, thanks. Okay, next we have Dr. Deborah Dorishow. Hi there, my name is, uh, let's see, am I unmuted now? Great. I'm Debbie Dorshow. I'm a medical oncologist, and I have the pleasure of being one of the two doctors in our uh, two main doctors in our early phase trials unit. And so I get to take care of patients who are on phase one and phase two trials of brand new cancer medications. Um, sometimes we look at these cancer medications alone or in combination with other medications that are already approved. And sometimes we look at medications that are already approved, but in a new setting. Um, and I really enjoy getting to bring exciting new science to the bedside and give patients uh, from all backgrounds the opportunity to try new options to treat their cancer. Thank you very much. Next, we have Dr. Scott Friedman. Hi, hey, everybody. Um, one second. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Scott Friedman. I'm the chief of the Division of Liver Diseases here at Mount Sinai, which is uh, separate from gastroenterology, and I'm a GI specialist by training. I'm also the co-director of the Cancer Mechanisms Program here at the Tisch Cancer Institute. And I also have a role as the Dean for Therapeutic Discovery on behalf of the medical school, all of which really intersect around the problems of uh, cancer, particularly in liver. And we'll talk more about that later, but I'm delighted to be part of the panel. Very good, thank you. Next, we have Dr. Miriam Murad. Hello, I'm Miriam Murad. I uh, direct the cancer immunology program with my colleague Nina Barwat. And uh, really the goal of the program is to identify immune-based immune -based strategy to treat cancer. And there is um, a lot of data that suggests that the, the, the immune microenvironment of, of, of tumor is really uh, completely modulated by exposure, uh, uh, inflammation, diet, uh, 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 and many other cues, you know, obesity, for example. And so there's a lot of interest in, in exploring uh, whether this immune microenvironment is uh, uh, differ between different communities or different exposures. And I hope that we could potentially discuss how, how this could apply to our outreach program and, and whether there is studies that can be done to really um, enhance our understanding of uh, inflammation driven or inflammation uh, contribution to cancer outcome across different communities. Thank you, doctor. Okay, next we have Dr. Jenny Lin. Hi, I'm Jenny Lin. I am a general primary care internist um, by training, and that is uh, what I do clinically um, within uh, the Tisch Cancer Institute. I am the co-leader of the Cancer Prevention Control Program, and so that is the program that is really um, concerned about uh, cancer control from the very beginnings of learning how to uh, recognize, identify, and modify risk factors such as smoking and obesity, as you've heard about today. Um, 
to prevention with um, early cancer detection and screening. So similar a little bit to what Dr. Friedman was talking about with uh, liver cancer detection or with the work that was done by Dr. Tawari with the prostate cancer mobile van and Dr. Mohammed alluded to it as well, all the way to the other end of um, cancer with regards to um, cancer survivorship and symptom management and control to palliative care um, and the end of life um, decisions. So that's what our program does. Um, and my work is primarily within the cancer um, survivorship world, although my clinical world is primarily in the cancer prevention world. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Okay, and finally, our final panelist is Dr. Janice Gabrilov. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Janice Gabrilov. I'm professor of medicine and a hematologist oncologist in the division of hematology and oncology. Within the Cancer Center, I have a role as uh, the Associate Director for Education and Training. And our focus is really on uh, really advancing, uh, catalyzing the next generation of uh, diverse and inclusive leaders and researchers in the field of cancer medicine and research. Um, I also direct the uh, clinical research education program that offers a number of degrees within the graduate school and lead a larger effort under our um, Center for Translational Science to really foster the growth and development of the workforce as a whole. I look forward to this panel and in discussing with you uh, novel and innovative educational uh, uh, platforms that can really enhance our, collaborative, our collaboration and our partnership uh, from investigators and community uh, stakeholders. Okay, so thank you very much to everyone. So we have three questions that were gathered from the community inquiry this past month. Um, I will have two to three panelists answer each question. After the answer, we'd like to open it up to discussion up to the audience. So you can put your questions in the Q&A and if it turns out we don't have time to answer them during this round table, We'll get those responses by email um, and via the chat. So my first question is directed to uh, Dr. Parsons, Dr. Gabrilov, and uh, Ms. Miller. So the question is, um, as leaders of the Cancer Center Clinical Trials and Education, you represent a broad range of research, clinical, and educational expertise and leadership. In relation to your professional space, can you each discuss what efforts and plans are or will be underway to increase inclusion of marginalized populations in research and education, given the disproportionate cancer burden in underserved communities? And um, I'll throw it out there as who wants to answer first. I guess I could take a stab at it. I think. The, the first thing uh, before we start is, um, is that uh, when uh, our Tisch Cancer Institute was started, uh, it, it, um, it was founded uh, in 2008. And as I showed in my introduction, but one of the things I didn't talk about was that when it was founded, it, it was founded with a one door policy so that there was one clinic for cancer patients uh, uh, in at the Ruttenberg Treatment Center. Uh, and then we have a separate clinic for all breast cancer patients at the Dubin Breast Center on the main campus. And, and similarly at the Women's Cancer uh, Center down in Chelsea, it's, it's a one clinic uh, there for everybody. Uh, so this was, this spirit of inclusivity has been with us for a long time. And as a result, uh, of that, and also because um, we're in New York City, which is a diverse place, um, as you saw from Karen Goodman's presentation, about 40% of our patients, 45% of our patients are minority patients. That said, um, I see that we're really at the forefront of trying to uh, learn and teach how to improve trial accrual uh, for diverse uh, populations. And uh, we have examples of this leadership on this call. In fact, uh, Nina Bikel leads a dream team to overcome this problem. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't see her. I guess she's on the, she's still here. Are you here still? But, here. but, but this, this is a, a wonderful dream team that's working with Einstein and Columbia together to sort of get a whole vast swath of 
upper Manhattan and the Bronx uh, to, to learn about the problem and also to sort of really, I think, explore the hypothesis. And, you know, please correct me because I, I, it's, it's a big, big pro program. But my understanding is, you know, if, if the first time a patient hears about clinical research is when they have a cancer diagnosis and they're seeing, um, uh, 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 you know, seeing their doctor uh, for the first time, and it's going to be hard for them to get over the hurdle of, of enrolling. And I think the concept is to increase education and awareness way upstream, um, and then to make sure it's implemented with culturally appropriate uh, 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 educational information. Nina, do you want to yeah, them. sure. So that, that is a critical piece of it. So we've been working with community from the very outset. Um, they, from, they helped design the entire project. And so one of our main aims is focused on community and with community, getting their input as to what the current understanding is about clinical trials so that being approached about a clinical trial is not equated with having no other options left. Um, and understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, what some of the critical beliefs are to be able to really counter that with messaging that really gets at many of the issues that came up in the word cloud actually. Um, and uh, so it's the combination of educating about clinical trials in general and what they mean, but also really getting at some of these underlying beliefs that you know, that won't even let uh, individuals hear about clinical trials because they just have a different mindset. Um, as we can see, this has been going on with COVID vaccination. Um, so, but- well, Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Gabriela. Yes, sorry. Um, this is clearly uh, a very important question and a very big question uh, that we can try to address uh, in incremental steps and with a vision and drive and leadership of the Cancer Center, as uh, Ramon has very nicely summarized. Um, I can give you a feel for some of the things that we've done. Uh, we have uh, worked and collaborated with community members, with our COE group, uh, with cancer prevention and control to develop uh, a, a T32 training grant for postdoctoral uh, trainees to really focus on the well being and the, the challenges in vulnerable populations. And the entire uh, grant is really focused on research in that arena and conducting mentored research and training the next generation of investigators to be aware and sensitized and devoted to that realm of research. Um, we work in partnership with Jenny Lin, Dr. Lin, uh, in this regard and develop a training a curriculum, both career skills and knowledge to advance that agenda. Um, another way we've done this is to really start very early by um, collaborating with pathway programs. So we've had a strong collaboration as Dr. Parekh uh, highlighted uh, with the CEYE program and the Sherman Scholars to advance uh, the diverse workforce of tomorrow by inspiring middle school and high school students to pursue uh, cancer research and to be aware of opportunities in this realm. Uh, we are putting together and are planning to launch in the future. It's in a planning phase of a um, fighting cancer uh, one day event where we invite middle schoolers and high schoolers from our community to really participate in an interactive forum, a fun filled fair, but at the same time educational and raising their awareness about the problem of cancer and what they can really do about it. And we're drawing uh, upon the background and expertise of the Friedman Brain Institute that has done this so well uh, regarding the development of neuroscience in the brain uh, for uh, students who are in our community. So those are just a couple of ways that we're beginning to try to uh, work towards uh, advancing uh, this um, important topic.
That's excellent. And Ms. Miller, do you want to uh, weigh in here? Yeah, um, no, I think I think one thing uh, theme that you might be hearing emerge is uh, collaboration and partnership. So, you know, the benefit of the Cancer Institute is really that we all work closely to tackle these complex, challenging uh, problems. Um, for us, you know, every treatment that we have today for cancer care came from a clinical trial, and that's the power of trials. We could accelerate discovery if more people participated because we'd be able to answer the question and inform the next stage of um, treatments and supportive care um, just by increasing participation. So I think for us, um, you know, at least particularly in the cancer clinical research support unit, we're focused on increasing awareness and increasing access and participation. We do that in part through our workforce. So we tend to seek and identify and hire a highly diverse workforce who interact with our patients day to day, who support them during their course of their trial participation, um, and who can understand their challenges. Many of our team members you know, live in Long Island and commute back and forth between our various health system locations and can specifically relate to the challenges of um, you know, of, of uh, financial toxicity that comes with, you know, having to travel for care um, and are tapped into some of the resources the Cancer Institute provides in terms of transportation or, um, you know, counseling or ge uh, genetic counseling and nutrition and navigation and those sorts of things. So I think our team really tries to support our patients by being the glue to the many different programs that are available within the, within the Cancer Institute to better serve our community. We're more focused on, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned earlier, moving towards where patients are, so bringing cancer care and more specifically clinical trials close to home. We're trying to leverage some of the things that we learned during the pandemic around what can be done virtually, what can be done electronically, um, to be able to alleviate some of the burdens for patients who participate in, in trials and still be able to collect the necessary information that we need to make the right decisions about the next steps. Excellent uh, response is real important uh, information. Thanks to uh, thanks to all of you. So moving on to our second question, this is directed to Dr. Lin and Dr. Dorshaw. Um, so we understand that holistic medicine is a priority for many of our community members. However, there are many challenges with integrating these services at cancer centers for a variety of reasons, such as cost of care and inadequate insurance reimbursement. Considering these challenges, how can we at TCI best provide information and access to these types of services? Also, looking forward, how can community input facilitate future efforts to integrate these services into clinical care and future research efforts? That's a mouthful. <laughs> I can promise I will certainly not answer all of the question in one go, but let me address some of it. Um, I think, you know, all of us feel very strongly that comprehensive care for people dealing with cancer involves not just treatment to try to shrink or get rid of their cancer, but involves really holistic management to make sure they're feeling as good as possible not only while they're getting cancer treatment, but also when they're done getting cancer treatment. Um, there are a lot of things that we do offer, but we don't offer everything here. So one thing, for example, that we frequently do is include a palliative care or supportive oncology consult. This is a team of physicians and nurses that are specifically trained to help manage symptoms um, and also just help people going through a really difficult time. Um, they also have a lot of resources, including on the inpatient side, aromatherapy. They also provide massage to patients who are in the outpatient infusion center. Um, but the person who asked the question is absolutely right. There are other adjunctive therapies, for example, like acupuncture, which we know based on really good data can help with certain kinds of pain or discomfort. Um, and those are really not frequently covered by insurance. So um, I, I agree that there is a lot more needed than just anti-cancer treatment, um, but that our, unfortunately our, our coverage system has a bit of a ways to go um, before being able to get insurance reimbursed for all of these different uh, complementary therapies. Okay. Um, 
And I, I will dovetail on uh, Dr. Dorsho's comments, which is um, really just to, I know um, folks have heard about the um, clinical trials that have been going on. And I think many people, when they think about cancer clinical trials, they're really thinking about the very traditional types of uh, phase one, phase two, phase three trials of testing a, a new uh, chemotherapy or a new radiation. But um, in cancer prevention and control, our program also um, does have a number of trials and they're smaller, um, but they involve um, a number of these adjunctive therapies like using hypnotherapy, for example, or light therapy to treat a number of cancer treatment and or cancer itself um, symptoms. So I urge people to think about that. I think also um, in response to Ms. Miller's comment about, you know, um, the collaboration and Dr. Dorosho also commented on it, we really do try to work as a team and having uh, a team approach to cancer care, I think is very important so that it's not just focused on getting rid of or shrinking the tumor, but thinking about other aspects. As a primary care physician, I think a lot about all the other medical problems that patients have besides their cancer, their diabetes, for example, and Dr. Gallagher mentioned a lot about that and its risk for cancer as well as um, its impact on cancer. So I, I manage a lot of um, that or hypertension. So not forgetting that they're, um, that our, our patients are our whole people. And um, so that's one thing I would encourage people in the community to think about is, you know, where are the community resources for these therapies? Can we partner with community sources that do this therapy? I know Dr. Mazur is doing a project with um, navigation to try and um, connect patients with other sources that are in the community. So not creating things from scratch, but knowing how to connect. Um, I think that's one of the best ways the community can help us um, help them. Thank you so much. And finally, our last question is directed to Dr. Murad and Dr. Friedman. And as leaders of the uh, cancer mechanisms and cancer immunology, we understand that the path to community engagement may be more complex yet equally valuable to cancer care equity. Given these challenges, what are some of the innovative ways the community and bench science researchers can come together to understand and address community and disparity-driven cancer priorities? A very important question. Miriam, you wanna go first? Go ahead. You're, you're muted, Miriam. I was saying to go ahead, Scott, because it's so related to the disease you focused on. Sure. So um, this is a really important question, and it allows me to take a slightly different uh, tack than what we've been talking about. Because, of course, the best way to cure cancer is to prevent it from occurring. And uh, since my greatest area of knowledge is in liver, I'll focus on that, although a lot of these principles certainly apply to other diseases where, there are, uh, where screening can have an impact. It, it turns out for liver cancer, the cancer almost never occurs in a completely healthy liver. So that tells us right away that there are underlying problems in the liver that we should be thinking about or we should be looking for in a patient who's a, who, who either has a liver cancer or more importantly, screening for liver cancer in patients who have underlying diseases. And some of them are uh, infectious like hepatitis viruses, B and C, um, but they're equally important causes that are environmental. And by that, I mean either obesity, which we heard about from Emily Gallagher, uh, which can lead to fat in the liver in association with other problems associated with obesity, but also alcohol. Um, and both education intervention uh, through screening and ultimately linkage to early care, particularly for diseases we can cure like viral hepatitis can be cancer preventing in the truest sense of the word. And so one of the uh, priorities that our group on the liver side more uh, in particular is working with uh, Dr. Smith and her team to establish or grow because we have some established programs already and we wanna grow those, uh, grow our presence in communities at high risk. And that certainly includes um, Latinos who have a genetic predisposition to liver cancer associated with uh, fat in their liver and diabetes. It also includes Africans and, and first-generation African-Americans, particularly Africans who have a high risk of hepatitis B. 
And there's a disease we can treat very effectively to markedly reduce the risk of cancer. And then in other immigrant, immigrant populations clustered in different uh, ethnic uh, neighborhoods is a high prevalence of hepatitis C. And that more than any other disease is now uh, totally amenable to prevention if we can catch the disease before advanced scarring has occurred in the liver because we have therapies now, oral drugs, antivirals that are extremely well tolerated and will cure hepatitis C in 95% or more of patients. So that becomes, then it becomes uh, uh, incumbent upon us to find those patients that have undiagnosed hepatitis C because we can cure them and prevent them from ever developing a cancer. And we have had an ongoing program that's now aligned with the, the community outreach and engagement program of the TCI to do exactly that, to reach out to at-risk communities, to screen them at either health fairs or community centers, uh, and to link them to care if they have underlying disease. And so uh, we think this is a huge opportunity, but also really a responsibility for us to identify populations at high risk and connect with them directly through our own care or indirectly by educating providers to screen for liver disease, particularly when there's a chance of cure. Thanks, Dr. Freeman. Dr. Murad? Yeah, so I can only expand on these. Um, you know, many, many I, I think it's, it is quite established now that somehow inflammation, you know, inflammation is all these inflammatory molecules that can be induced upon exposure to polymer. Uh, we know that inflammation increases with um, poor diets, you know, uh, uh, that, that somehow uh, uh, exercise can, can have a, also a big role in modulating inflammatory molecules that are circulating in our blood. And this inflammatory component we know is uh, uh, associated with increased disease or cancer formation. So there is a huge interest in the field is understanding whether we could prevent, if we were to really understand some of these inflammation or measure inflammation in patients, whether we could uh, try to, uh, uh, by blocking inflammation, prevent you know, cancer formation or potentially cancer progression. Well, so I'm going to give you a very concrete example of lung cancer, for example. There has been a very big study showing that a specific inflammatory molecule called the uh, interleukin-1 uh, 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 can contribute to cancer either formation or progression. There was a big study done by cardi uh, cardiovascular teams, you know, and thousands of patients where blockade of IL-1 beta was given to prevent cardiovascular event. And... Um, they did prevent some cardiovascular event, which uh, connection with inflammation is very established. But what was very clear in this very large study is that blocking IL-1 beta <coughs> molecule strongly prevented uh, lung cancer. Uh, lung cancer, I would say, potentially formation or detection. So now there is a very big interest in understanding, okay, so can we use that now in the real world? So one study that uh, several of us are, are now discussing is, can we really start measuring inflammation in some patients at risk and see whether blockade of these molecules could really prevent a, a cancer progression? So a, a, a study that I would like to discuss with the community is in patients that are, you know, there is some community that, for example, are, are more at risk. So they smoke more, they have, they, 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 they have you know, this type of diet that is a pro-inflammatory diet, so a diet associated with, which we call the high fat diet, more associated with obesity. All of these, if, if we can identify group of patients where that are that are more at risk, and so we will be screening not only screening using you know, screening for cancer, but also screening for this inflammatory component, and potentially uh, thinking about clinical trial for this specific group of patients, which are uh, more at risk of having this inflammation-driven cancer. So there are a lot of initiatives that we can discuss. But of course, you can use the same initiative to educate on, on the need to change your diet and uh, uh, the, 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 this diet associated the diet uh, contribution to inflammation is something we also study and it's measurable and we can educate upon. And there is a clear association with the diet and inflammation, clear association with inflammation and cancer. And um, we could 
we will be very interested in thinking about education component, but also specific clinical trials that are associated with prevention and screening. Well, I appreciate this so much. And um, uh, the community that I serve here on the Lower East Side, uh, um, there are certain uh, forms of cancer that seem to be prevalent. And of course, correlating with that is we have a high uh, diabetes rate in the community we serve here. So it's, it's, it's really a challenge. And this has certainly been educational for all of us. And I appreciate all your perspectives um, on everything we've just discussed today. So um, Dr. Snow, I don't know if we have time um, for questions. Um, I'm going to turn this over to yeah, you. I think now. we're out of time. Thank you so much to all of our panelists and for you, um, Ms. Smith, for uh, moderating for us. And uh, we'll now move on to the last part of our retreat. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Sarah Miller, who will speak to us for a few minutes about her study involving the community. Welcome, Sarah. Dr. Miller. Hi, thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you so much for giving me a couple minutes. This has been a fantastic event. It's really nice to hear all about all the important work that everyone is doing. Um, I wanted to take just a very quick minute to talk about a study that we are doing at Mount Sinai. Um, so what we're trying to do is think about, think critically about the way that we are doing cancer screening. Um, and one possible idea that we have is to streamline and centralize our cancer screening efforts. Um, so as it stands currently, screening efforts are often um, siloed based on various specialties. And we're interested in possibly testing more of a one-stop shop approach where people can, um, attend a cancer screening clinic and get screened for all of their necessary cancers. Um, but of course, the most important uh, step for us, we really want to make sure that this is something that um, the community would be interested in and um, is something that they would need. And so we are hoping to, um, we developed a very quick survey. It takes about five minutes just asking uh, different thoughts and feelings about this new idea. Um, and so if you are interested in taking the survey, you can scan this QR code. Um, and yeah, just ask a couple of questions and we would really greatly value your input and feedback. Thank you. Okay, we'll just give people, folks a minute to scan the QR code. And thank you so much to Dr. Miller for sharing this important survey with us today. And as the retreat is coming to a close, we are going to ask you to do another survey today. Um, we greatly value the community input and would love to get feedback on how we could improve for next year's retreat. Uh, kindly let us know if you have any thoughts about what we can do next year and what you'd like to learn about or any different ways that we can get community members involved. We'd love to hear your thoughts and really appreciate you coming today. If you can scan this QR code on the screen by opening your camera on your phone, holding it up to the screen, your phone should be able to scan the code and then the link will pop up that will take you to our survey. And again, it should take less than five minutes to complete. Um, while people are filling out the survey, I would like to share Zarina's um, message in the question and answer. She uh, wrote that she'd like to mention the role of chaplains, how they help to ease anxiety in patients and families um, in inpatient and outpatient settings at Mount Sinai, and that chaplains are integrated into interdisciplinary teams. So just wanted to share that with everyone and also uh, share that um, I am a social worker and we also have social workers who are here and integrated into our cancer centers at Mount Sinai who also support patients and families in conjunction with our chaplain colleagues um, and are integrated into our interdisciplinary team. So we hope to be helpful um, to anyone in need. I am gonna now pass the mic over again to Dr. Smith who will wrap things up. So thank you all for hanging in there with us um, over these last three hours. We've been really excited to have you here. 
um, and to be able to start this really important work to connect uh, the Mount Sinai cancer research community and clinical community um, with all of you. And so I, there are some themes that have stood out for me for today. Um, certainly there are lots of ways for us to align what we're doing here in the Cancer Center with those needs that you have told us, our needs in the community, particularly around diabetes care, obesity, understanding the things that we can be doing to decrease cancer risk. Um, and also that word cloud sticks out for me. And for those of you who may not be familiar with word clouds, the words that are the biggest are the words that have been typed in the most. And so really the three things that popped out are, are trust, awareness, and time. And so I think this is a first step for us to start talking about awareness. And as we continue to engage with all of you, we'll be able to start addressing that more, starting to get into the trust issues. Um, and also talking about time to be able to commit to this work. And so in closing, I would like to thank all of, all of you who came to join us today. I would like to thank all of our speakers from the Tisch Cancer Institute. I would in particular like to thank our community members, Ms. Colette Smith for sharing with us their specific stories, as well as Mr. Jean-Claude Noel for sharing his experience in being a citizen scientist. I would also like to thank our moderators, Ms. Inez West and Ms. Betsy West for taking the time to be with us today and engaging in these conversations. Thank you all once again. This is just the beginning of a really important journey um, and we'll hopefully see you all again as the year goes on. Thank you.